All right, we're recording. Thank you. Good evening. It's February 6th, 2023. This is a regular meeting of the town council. We are allowed to hold this meeting virtually as well as be in the room based on the open meeting law that was extended on November 7th, 2022. This meeting is accessible in real time, by phone, in person, and on Amherst Media. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the February 6th, 2023 town council meeting to order at 6.32 p.m. Um, I will be calling on each counselor to make sure that you can hear us and we can hear you. Uh, and then please mute your mic again. We'll start with Shalini Balmil. I'm present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Here. Kathy Shane. Present. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker is still not here, but let's make sure we check the audience. Okay. I don't see Alicia yet, but we'll keep an eye out for her. Um, let me just complete this by saying, uh, there's no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. To make a comment, use the raised hand button. And if technical difficulties arise, we will pause the meeting if necessary and make note of that. Um, with that, I'm going to move to the announcements. And on your agenda that's printed and in the packet, we have included a variety of upcoming council meetings and committee meetings including several that occur between now and the next time we meet, which is not till February 27th. We also wanna call attention to two special events going on in town. One is the Winterfest, which has been going on since a week ago, and particularly the Fire Ice and now Luminary event on Saturday, February 11th on the Town Common. In addition to that, we want to make sure you're aware that one of our counselors is being uh, presenting a um, exhibit at Amherst College, Ancestral Bridges, and that is Anika Lopes, uh, building upon historical photographs, et cetera, that she and her family have had here for generations. That exhibit actually opens on February 9th and will go through the summer. There's no hearings this evening. There are 11 people in the audience. And I wanna note that there are two people here in person. Welcome. Uh, if either of you would like to make public comment, please make sure you sign in at the sheet over where Athena is, okay? And uh, we're getting ready for public comment. So if you are on Zoom, please raise your hand if you would like to make public comment. So Athena, I'm going to ask you to start. Our commenter is Roz. So if you'd please come up to the microphone here and state your name and district or address before making you. your comment. Um, hello, my name is Razwan CB. I live on Spring Street in Amherst. Um, I'd like to say a few words in favor of the proposed special act extending voting rights to lawful permanent residents for municipal elections. 
I have lived in Amherst for 20 years now, um, but I was only eligible for citizenship a few years ago. Uh, as soon as I got it, I started voting in municipal elections. I've been voting in everything since then. Um, and I'd like to say just a couple, I'd like to note a couple of things uh, in favor of this proposal. The first thing I'd like to note is uh, the fundamental principle that underlies the proposal. And that is that those who are directly affected by the actions of a government authority, particularly when it comes to taxes and policing, should have a say in how the government runs and who, who runs it. Uh, Non-citizen permanent, non -citizen permanent residents are just as affected by taxation and policing as residents who are citizens and therefore I think they should deserve the, they deserve the suffrage as well. The second point I'd really like to make has to do with the popular assumption that citizens should come first citizenship should come first and voting should come after that. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that way, not legally or the US Constitution has nothing to say on this account and indeed several towns in the United States, especially in Maryland and Vermont, have the suffrage for non-citizen permanent residents, not historically, because from the beginning of uh, the founding of this country until the 1920s, uh, non-citizens actually did vote in all kinds of elections, including federal elections, and not morally, because as I mentioned before, it's only fair that if you are uh, affected by the local government when it comes to taxation, to policing, and for the purposes of the census, then you should have a say in uh, who is running that government. Thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, there's a third gentleman has just joined us in the room. Would you like to make public comment? If Okay, thank you. Okay, seeing no other hands for public comment, we're going to go on to our next agenda item. It's the consent agenda. And I just want to make note as I go through the consent agenda uh, of two things. First of all, there are several items on the consent agenda that are votes to refer, but later on, we're going to actually discuss them, even though we, if we leave them on consent, you've already voted to refer. It just cuts down on the number of roll call votes we have to do, cuts down on time. But if you would like to remove something because you are not comfortable with that, please state that and ask that that item removed. The following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no current controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later, unless it's already going to be discussed, ask that it be removed when I, after I list the consent items. Uh, the request to remove an item does not require a second. So the motion is as follows, to move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 8D1, referral of the elementary school building project debt authorization to the finance committee. That is one we will discuss later. This just is a referral. Referral of debt exclusion ballot language and impact to taxpayers to the finance committee. Again, it's a referral, but we'll discuss it later. Referral of non-citizen voting special legislation to governance organization and the legislation committee. Again, a referral, but we'll discuss it later. Approval of long-term reservations of public way, Amherst Farmers Market. And then there's an approval of several minutes. They include, um, November 14th, 2022, Special Town Council Meeting Minutes. November 21, 2022, Special Town Council Meeting Minutes Public Forum on the Budget. November 21, 2022, Regular Town Council Meeting Minutes. January 4, Special Town Council Meeting Minutes, Joint Meeting with Governance, Organization, and Legislation Committee. January 12, tw uh, 2023, Special Town Council Meeting Minutes, Joint Meeting with Con Community Resources Committee and Finance Committee. January 23rd, 2023, Special Town Council Meeting Minutes, Elementary School Building Project. And January 23rd, 2023, Regular Town Council Meeting Minutes. 
are there items that people would like removed from the consent agenda? Seeing no hands, I'm seeking a second. Pam, I'm sorry, Pam, you have a hand up. 8F, approval of long-term reservation of public way Amherst Farmers Market. You'd like that removed for discussion. Thank you. It's fine. Lynn, Lynn uh, sorry, I can't hear Pam um, and I'm virtual. So I just wanted Thank to- Thank you. It. Pam, could you turn your mic yes, on? Yes, I forgot to push my mic down. And it is 8F, approval of long-term reservation of public way for the Amherst Farmers Market. That's being removed from the consent agenda. Are there any others that people would like to request removal from the consent agenda? Do we have a technology problem? We're gonna take a pause for just a moment. Oh, okay. Um, is there a second to the motion? Second, Devlin Gothier. Okay. Uh, then we're going to move to the vote. I just want to check one more time to see if Alicia has joined us. Nope. Okay. Um, we'll start with uh, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Greesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> um, Alicia Walker is presently absent and Shalini Balmil. Yes. The motion pa is unanimous, passes 12 in favor and one person absent. We have no resolutions and proclamations tonight and we have no presentations and discussions. This allows us to move immediately to the action items Although let me note that action item A has been withdrawn. And the reason it's been withdrawn is because once the decision was made that the council wanted the ground, the wires to be underground, they didn't need to erect another pole. And so there's no change in the petition. Um, all right, we're gonna move on to the Centennial Funding Supplemental Budget Request. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that I'm going to call on Paul. Alicia is in the audience. Alicia is in the audience. Please bring her in, please. And Athena, when you have a moment, you can take the consent agenda down. Thank you. Alicia, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you, Lynn. And welcome. Um, we've already gone through public comment and the consent agenda. We're moving on to the action items because there are because there are no resolutions or presentations and discussions. So I'm going to call on Paul and Sean Mangano, Guilford Mooring, and Amy Rusick from DPW. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so again, being joined by Finance Director Sean Mangano, um, Assistant Superintendent of Public Works Amy Rusecki, and Superintendent of Public Works Guilford Mooring. We'd recently gone out to bid for the Centennial Water Treatment Plant. Bids came in. Bids were higher than we had an appropriation for. So we're coming back to the council for requests for additional appropriation. And I think first we'll start with why this is 
what the pricing change was and Guilford can talk a little bit about that and Sean can talk a little bit about what the financing what the request is specifically to the council Guilford good evening so um most of the price increase was inflation um, there was one item in particular which are the filters for the treatment plant they were they doubled in price so they added several million dollars to the project themselves. And then the rest of the rest of the price increase is just inflation over the time since the estimate was made, which to tell the truth, the estimate was not was not more than a year old. Um, so we're seeing we're still seeing in the marketplace uh, rising cost, especially in steel and electronics. Uh, we're also seeing delays in delivery, which um, is affecting some of the pricing as well. So those are the two are uh, the three items, uh, three areas that cause the price to go up. Um, as you see in the note, we can um, we recommend that you do uh, increase the price so, or increase the appropriation so we can continue with the project. Okay, if I hop in as well, Lynn. Please. So the um, the previous debt authorization that the council approved was for $18 million, um, and even that number had a little bit of uh, conservative conservatism built in. The, I think the costs were projected around 17 million. So we thought we had enough cushion in case uh, construction escalation kicked in. Um, but as you saw from the bid results, it came in even higher, much higher than even that, which already had a little bit, bit of wiggle room in it. Um, so the request is to authorize debt for the new total amount of the project, which is a requirement of the state revolving fund um, financing program. So it's to increase the debt, or it's actually to rescind the previous debt authorization, which was for 18 million, and to replace it with a new debt authorization for 21.5 million. Um, and the memo uh, gives you a little um, summary of the financial impacts, which um, it does increase the cost to the water fund, but the silver lining is that the state revolving fund has extended a larger loan, or uh, at least in the conversations that Guilford has had with them, they've offered a larger loan, um, which means that we'll get more forgiveness and we'll get the beneficial interest rate of going with a state revolving fund for a greater portion of the project. And they um, they offer a rate of 1.5%, which is much lower than the market rate right now. Um, and they also offer 0% construction financing so that the whatever we borrow through them, we don't have to pay any interest on while we're borrowing it um, or until we go out for a permanent financing. So um, we're asking you to rescind the previous authorization and replace it with the new one. Uh, and both those orders are attached to the memo. Okay. And I just remind you this, we already voted to refer this to the finance committee, but now's the time for questions from the council. Dorothy. Once this is done, do we have it the cost lot uh, locked in or can they increase it well sorry Go i can first. answer that <laughs> um the contractor the contractor is locked in for his bid price um there is a contingency which is required by srf which i don't think we'll use it the srf is a state revolving fund they require all contracts with them to have a five percent contingency which for this project is almost a million dollars. And I don't think we'll come close to using all of that. Well, I don't expect to use any of it actually. Um, so I we're pretty much to uh, this increase will be um, all we'll need is what we expect. Okay, thank you. If I can just add to that. So what we actually have bids, we have contractors who said they will build the plant for a fixed sum amount, which, which is in the memo, the $18,870,000. So that's, we've gone out to, to competitive bid. We had three bidders and this is the low bid. So they have put pen to paper, looked at the project and said, we'll build it for this. And once we sign a contract with them, there's the contingency of course, but that, that's what they will, they will build it for. Okay, Mandy Joe, before I call on you, I just wanna note that Jennifer Taub uh, is in the room, but she's having technical difficulties. So she's able to participate, but you just can't see her on the screen. Okay, Mandy Joe. She looks stymied too. Um, I, I don't actually have a question. I wanted to say thank you to Guilford and um, Sean and all. And we know um, those of us have been on the council for two terms, how much the cost of this project has gone up, but we also know how 
important this project is for the future um, resiliency of our town to keep that water supply um, available. Um, but I wanted to say thank you for figuring out a way to um, get the state revolving what, whatever that program is to increase its loan amount to us because I believe the last time we voted the loan amount they were willing to loan us was 14 million and so any increase above that is huge so thank you for working on that to to do that thanks double that thank you anything else anybody else have questions yes Kathy I'm on finance so I get to ask it again tomorrow but um along the lines with Mandy which I also thank you for. Do we know, and I don't need an answer now, do we know whether any of the things that are moving at the state level now um, that are around climate or resiliency would help us with this? And so I know there's some infrastructure bills. So I'm not saying slow this down, but that might help down the road. So we actually discussed that this, this morning. Um, we have this along with several other projects on our list to go to our state and federal legislators. This is a perfect project for them. It's shovel ready. We have actual bids. And if they wanted to dedicate some funds to help offset water and or sewer infrastructure, this is the project that they can contribute to. So we'll be actively working on this as well. Okay. Anything else, Kathy? Pam Rooney. Thanks. Um, I was looking at the, the current budget and the engineering fees. Will those fees or have those fees gone up as part of this bid or are the fees remaining relatively stable? No, the engineering fees are stable. They have not gone up in the last three estimates. We've kind of we cut that down and we actually have a chance to maybe lower the engineering fees a little bit, but um, they haven't gone up. Okay. Pam, anything else? Are there any other questions on this item? Alicia. I'm wondering um, if the town, like what kind of climate action lens the town is using during the bidding process? Okay. Guilford or Amy? So during the design process, everything we've looked at has been um, pretty much cutting edge technology. So we're reducing our electric cost and we're reducing all of our overhead costs for actually running the facility. That's been looked at um, quite in, in detail. Um, the only thing that um, we truly haven't looked at is, um, and actually we'll probably start looking at it now, is trying to actually pursue some offsets from Eversource for actually improving the efficiency of the new facility over the old facility, which is something that's still left for us to look at. Alicia, was there any follow-up on that? Um, no, that is helpful. I'm just also wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on what the, the, the delay or the complications have been so far. Well, the, the delay in bidding or delay in material that's going to we expect yes getting to the bidding process well the bidding has been on track um, we had to slow it down because we did get the what we call the srf the state revolving fund loan they have special requirements and part of the engineering cost is actually to pay our consultant to meet those requirements um, so that slowed it down a little bit in the bidding process um, but now we're on track and we're moving moving well. As long as we appropriate the uh, additional funds, the project will be starting probably um, within a month after signing the contract, which we hope will probably be around April. Okay. Any further questions? Andy? Yeah, this is not, um, as with Kathy, I'm on the Finance Committee, so... I don't need an answer today because if it's not available is an easy answer. We can always uh, report it back to the council at a later meeting. On the memorandum itself um, on page, I believe it is uh, page five at the top, there's a, uh, a chart that shows the projected increase in water and sewer rates, the amount and percentage. And, uh, that's always very helpful, but 
what I'm curious about is how much of the in, how much the increase has gone up as a result of the increase um, that has happened with today's uh, news and what we're dealing with today. So if uh, uh, you can give that um, estimate to us at least a little bit tomorrow, that would be helpful. But I thought I'd just mention it tonight. Lynn, can I quickly respond to that one? Please. Um, so if you if you look, um, so that chart that you're um, referencing, Andy, um, so there's a line a little bit less than halfway down that says estimated cost increase, and it's probably not super descriptive um, or described as well as it could have been. Um, but that line of $60,000 per year is the estimated increase from uh, the proposed, the, the request to increase the debt authorization. And that 60000 per year is essentially the increase in debt service that, the, that we project as a result of the higher debt authorization. Um, so if you look at the estimated rate, um, the top green line, that's our projected rate if we went forward sort of status quo. Um, the lower shaded green line is the projected increase with the um, higher debt service cost for this project or for, for the, the new authorization we're proposing. And again, the increase um, isn't as great as one might expect because of the um, the extension of the preferable rates from the state revolving fund. Andy, further questions? I guess that I'm still, uh, I understand the chart, but uh, the question was about how much the increase, how much is the increase to the increase? Andy, I, I um, we can't hear you on the, I mean, we can kind of hear you, but you're, the mic's not on. I'm sorry, I was, I was pressing it, but right. um, um, the, the, the question I was asking was the, how much is the increase to the increase as a result of the so change for, in the yeah. price? So for example, if you look at FY26, that's when we expect the permanent debt um, would start from Centennial. Uh, if we, if you weren't to do this, um, you know, if we, if we were still in this world where we could do the $18 million project, um, the projected increase was gonna be 11.8% that year. Um, and we were gonna have a water rate of $5.88. Uh, with this uh, request to increase the debt authorization up to 21.5, um, the increase now is gonna be 13% in that year. And it'll be, the rate will be about six cents higher um, as a result. And then going forward, everything sort of levels off. Um, because once we get that debt in place, it's just, it carries forward year after year. Okay, thank you. Um, using my privilege as a counselor, uh, ask a question regarding that chart, but you don't have to put it up. So in other words, we will see this for the first time when we approve the FY26 rate. The rates that you're showing us, however, do not show any adjustment for the potential of a change based on the new water regulations that we'll be looking at within the next month or so. Right, yeah, but there's a, a lot of complex factors that could merge onto this chart if we wanted to. Uh, so, so you saw a similar chart um, that we shared with Finance Committee that had the impact of the um, water and sewer regulations as well. So if, if the Finance Committee wants, we could sort of merge this chart and that chart and do a um, sort of what if scenario if both um, actions pass. And since we're discussing water and sewer tomorrow at finance, that would be a time to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dorothy? <clears throat> I'm remembering from some meetings in the past that sometimes debt <clears throat> is structured so that it diminishes over time. Uh, it sounded like you were saying it was going to be the exact same amount every year. Um, mm -hmm. Just curious to ask you how you're going to structure the debt on this one. Yeah, so this one right now we're projecting as um, flat each year would be the same amount. Um, and so what that does is it'll lower um, the amount in the early years. Um, you pay a little bit more over the life of the debt, but it makes the early years, the first five or six years more manageable um, mm -hmm. than if you started out high um, and came down over the life of the debt. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, Pam. Thanks. Uh, so just to make sure I understand it, the the estimated rates per 100 cubic feet, um, the current rate is 475 100 cubic foot. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it will it will increase by 3.4% by 7%, etc. But from today's value, 
uh, in the in the sixth year, we're actually looking at about 30% more per 100 feet than we pay today. Uh, and that, that to me is, is a pretty big number. Um, so that, if I understand though, is what today's rates with today's equipment, with today's um, distribution is, the difference with the new plant coming or the revised plant um, is a slight uptick in those rates um, by the sixth year. Is that correct? So um, let, tell me if this answers your question. So um, the the reason why it's going up significantly and we've been projecting to go up significantly is because of the Centennial project. It started out at 11 million um, and went up to 18 million. Uh, but the that's a significant new debt obligation in the water fund that we have to raise rates in order to pay. Um, so that's why the rates have been trending up. And you see that in that top portion of the chart uh, where it shows current debt and it goes from an FY25 goes from about 800,000 and it goes up to about 1.3 million in FY26. That's the projection of the, the $18 million centennial project. Um, so that's one reason why the rates are going up and why it, it goes up significantly in that year, FY26. Um, the other thing that's influencing rates to go up um, is the consumption. So pre-COVID, our consumption uh, was over that $1 million per 100 cubic feet level. Um, it dropped off significantly during the pandemic, as you can imagine, with um, UMass depopulating and Amherst College, um, all the students going home. Um, and so we haven't seen it come back up to the levels we'd like to see it come back up to. Um, and some of that we think is just, you know, new buildings have more efficient systems, um, but it, it is something we're monitoring closely. And so that consumption number is a key number that influences the rates as we are more efficient, which is a, a good thing for the environment. Um, on the rate side, it pushes it up um, because our infrastructure or the water system is very infrastructure heavy. And so there's not an easy way to reduce operating costs when consumption goes down a little bit. Um, really, the only thing you can do is that at a certain point, you may be able to take off a major water source, um, but we're not at that point yet. And given the concerns around water, um, water usage in the future, um, we're avoiding that. Pam, does that answer your question? Okay. Are there any other questions from the council? Okay. Seeing none, this will be taken up by finance tomorrow, Andy. Is that correct? Or not until the 21st? No, it's tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and again, it's already been voted on in terms of referral. It's actually an automatic referral to the finance committee. Um, the next is also an automatic referral to the finance committee, uh, but we are going to have a brief presentation about the Community Preserva Preservation Act Committee's recommendations. Uh, there will be a more detailed presentation at the finance committee meeting tomorrow. I'm so, oh, that's right. That's not until the 21st of February. Okay. So Centennial, I mean, I'm sorry, Community Preservation Act. And this is Sean. Yeah. Okay. So I'll go, go right ahead. This will be a very brief presentation. Um, it may help actually just to bring up that um, financial order FY 2407A has a nice summary of the projects that have been approved. Yeah, perfect. So um, the CPA committee has uh, wrapped up their work for the most part. Um, they have recommended uh, $2,349,959 um, of projects. And in addition to that, they have also recommended a $700,000 borrowing authorization. So of the projects that they've recommended, not including the debt authorization for now, um, 1580000 or so was for community housing, and it's those top four projects you see there, um, two of which will um, contribute substantially to the affordable housing stock in town if they move forward. Um, 366000 was for historic preservation, um, and, and three of those projects are for uh, basically preservation of historic assets in town, um, including the, the paintings, the Mabel Loomis Todd paintings. And then the last 403,000 is for recreation and open space uh, for the war memorial projects and the conservation area improvements. 
And then again, in addition to the, um, the 403,000 you see here for open space and recreation, uh, there's a $700,000 debt authorization recommended for the Fort River fields um, as part of the elementary school building project. And so all of that sort of comes together. Um, if you look at that chart at the bottom, you'll see the total available resources for FY24 was about 2.8 million. Um, the projects that were recommended above was the 2.3 million, and that leaves $443,460 left, uh, which is the amount needed for debt service for uh, CPA projects that were previously approved for debt in the past um, that the council has approved. Um, and so that is uh, what has been recommended for a slate of projects. There is one project that has sort of been um, not deferred, it's still ongoing consultation with the committee that might come back in the future. Um, the uh, town planning department is working with the applicant to sort of make sure the um, kind of clarify the scope of the project. If that project does come forward, it would be funded through an existing uh, CPA reserve that was um, appropriated in the past. Um, so it wouldn't require any new resources, but it would still have to go through the same process um, of approval with the town council. Um, so that one, we don't know for sure if it's gonna come up this year, but it could come up later in the year. And if it does, we'll link it up with the, the regular budget process. So uh, there's an opportunity to ask questions or just point different things you would like the finance committee to pay attention to. Um, Mandy Jo. Um, just a question on that one that says repurposed debt, um, Kendrick Park. Uh, does that require a separate vote? Who repurposes that since we supposedly authorized that for Kendrick Park? I haven't seen anything related to that. And since if it hasn't been repurposed yet, can can we authorize spending above the estimated amount um, that is available at this point to spend? Sean? So that's when I wish I had my friend Sonia right here to answer the, the debt repurposing <laughs> question. Um, so, uh, so yes, that is for Kendrick Park. It was related to um, that project that uh, we didn't need to borrow as much as we thought we were going to need to. Um, and so we can use it for a like purpose. It'll be part of um, the slate that you vote. Um, but what we're proposing is to use it for a like purpose, which was for recreation. Any further question? Okay. Michelle. <clears throat> yes. Um, could you explain, um, I see that there are, there's an, there's an award on there that is calling for borrowing. Um, so I think that's the $700,000, like a separate appropriation mm -hmm. order. Um, and then others are not for borrowing. So I'm just trying to understand what is, and I'm sorry if I miss this kind of the last round, but what, why would one be for borrowing and others, you know, not what, what distinguishes those? Yeah, so um, I think there's, um, so it's ultimately up to the CPA committee what they recommend. Uh, some of it comes down to the volume of projects that you have and ways to make it all work. Um, and then some of it comes down to how expensive an individual project is. So this year was a, a year where there was a large um, dollar volume, uh, dollar amount for the projects that were proposed. Um, so the only way to do all the projects uh, was to include a borrowing for one, at least one of them. And the CPA committee uh, decided to include the borrowing for the Fort River project um, because it was the original request for the, uh, the Fort River project was um, somewhere over $2 million. They had a, ended up coming down from the original request um, to do what they felt comfortable with. Um, but that's why that one was uh, proposed as a borrowing because they, they couldn't have done it otherwise. Okay, so there's not like particular rules that trigger a borrowing. It's really just a matter of looking at the whole pie and then trying to figure out what. Yeah. How to make it, work. it still has to be um, something that's that we can borrow for. For example, like it couldn't be an operating type expense. It has to be um, something capital. And so when the you know if it is approved, that's something that future CPA committees will have to balance. Is every year we uh, will present to the CPA committee how much money they're expected to have, and then the first thing we show them is how much gets taken off from debt from previously approved projects. Um, so again, this year the amount taken off the top was four hundred forty-three thousand four hundred sixty. Um, we showed the CPA committee what that looks like when the Jones Library CPA project that was approved a couple of years ago kicks in. 
Um, we show them what it looks like when the um, Amherst uh, Regional High School track and field, which was a CPA, um, had CPA funding, but that was dead as well when that kicks in. And then with this project next year, well, if, if this is approved, we'll show them what it looks like when this kicks in. We have to make some assumptions around when the debt would actually kick in, um, but we want the committee to know how much is already obligated with that. And, we, and there is a balance. There's no perfect number, but we don't want we don't want all the CPA funds to be pre-obligated with debt from other projects um, because that sort of ties the hands for for future CPA committees. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, just to clarify, um, including this uh, borrowing for seven hundred thousand dollars, that would be then it would not be part of the elementary school budget. Uh, it would be just part of the CPA budget. Is that correct? That's the plan. Is that yeah? If this is approved before the um, the rest of the budget for the elementary school project is approved, um, that this would be able to come off the top of what would have to be borrowed. It would still okay. be a borrowing that the town would pay back, but it would be paid back from CPA funds as opposed okay. to a debt exclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Kathy. Um, I was just going to say you will be able to see longer paragraphs on each of these to the extent you want to see um, content on them. And I want to commend the committee and Sean for what Sean just said in answer to you, Michelle, is they make these numbers work. So they look at the money that's coming in. And then when you look in out years, you can see some of these projects don't hit for a few years because you don't need to borrow it until it starts. So trying to figure out is it, are they all coming together in 2027 or 2028 versus we have some more, we have some flexible room in the middle of it. So it's, um, it takes a lot of work and I really appreciate the staffing because the committee goes back and forth with them to try to make this work. Um, I do have one question, and that is, what is left in the CPA balance? And the reason I asked that question is because at least twice in our tenure as a council, uh, we have voted off cycle for CPA money. Uh, once was for Kendrick Park to match a grant. The other one was for, uh, I believe, the Belchertown Road property. There may have even been a third. So. I'm just trying to figure that out by looking at this. Yeah, so so there's not much left. Um, in order to make this work, they did have to reduce how much they set aside as a reserve. Um, so the reserve has been something that's fluctuated in past years. Some years they had no reserve, um, but they did decide for a couple of years to have a reserve, um, as you noted. Uh, but to make this all work, they had to dip into it. So I believe what's left over is about $170,000 or so as a reserve. and that is uh, under consideration for that other project that I was telling you about that um, the committee is still um, considering. Okay. So it's possible there's no reserve if this is all approved. Um, one of the things that Sonia point, pointed out that I've um, been talking with her is that because we do the CPA process earlier now as well, the reserve is not quite as um, helpful as it was in the past where we did the CPA process later in the year in the spring. Yeah. Since we do it now in the fall, um, we really have to make a decision on whether or not to use the reserve much earlier. So um, not to say we won't ever do a reserve again, but that's with some of the thinking why uh, there's not as much this year. Thank you. Are there any other questions on this at this point? Again, it's a referral to the finance committee who they will take it up on February 21st. And if ready, bring it back to the council on February 28th. Um, no, 27th, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? See none. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are going to go on to the next, it, which is a large item on the elementary school building project. I believe we're going to start with a presentation. Uh, I'm going to call on Paul and Sean Mangano, and they're, the discussion regarding this will be broken into three parts after the presentation. One is debt authorization. The next one is debt exclusion, including the ballot language and impact on taxpayers. And the third is debt exclusion, particularly selecting a special election date, early voting dates and locations, and whether we do mail-in ballots. None of these will be decided tonight. They are all referrals to the Finance Committee. Okay. 
but it's an opportunity for that preliminary discussion. Uh, Sean and Paul? Yeah, so I'll frame it and then Sean will do the PowerPoint. And also I wanna note that Town Clerk Sue Adet is here in the audience and can join if you have any questions um, as well. Okay. Um, so this is our first presentation on the actual finances for the uh, elementary school building project. In order to build this new building, we will need to borrow the funds to do that. Once we get authorization from the council to borrow the funds, we will also, not once, but in addition, we also will need the council to place a, a question on the ballot to ask the voters to exclude this from the limits of Proposition 2.5 called a debt exclusion. Um, this is a majority vote at the ballot box. And uh, along with those, along that line, there are some questions, some decisions you need to make about the actual election itself. You need to choose the date and you need to choose if you want to include early voting, uh, in, uh, early in-person voting. So those are the questions that are before you. Again, not looking for any decisions tonight, um, but but for in, later in February on the election decisions. And so I think what we want to do is sort of frame this. And Sean, you want to do the PowerPoint? Sure. Um, is it okay if I just share my own screen, Lynn? I think I have access to. Can you uh, see the presentation on the screen? We can. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So tonight, yeah, we kick off the planning around the debt exclusion process and providing some of the numbers. Okay. Um, so the agenda, do you guys see a Zoom quit unexpectedly? What is going on here? Sorry. Good. Everyone can see everything on the screen still? Kind of some weird we error can. messages. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we're going to talk about where we are as a town, uh, the project costs real quickly, uh, the plan for funding the project, a little background around what a debt exclusion is, uh, the uh, impacts or the estimated impacts of a debt exclusion uh, for our taxpayers, and then talk about next steps. So the town has received the reconciled cost estimate, uh, which basically just means that two separate cost estimating firms have um, estimated the cost of the project, and then they've gotten together and reconciled the differences between those two cost estimates um, to come up with a middle ground. And then the town's uh, consultants, our architect Nisco and our project manager Answer, have also vetted these cost estimates. So we have a, a good solid uh, total project cost number. That includes an estimate for escalation, um, just following up on our centennial discussion that we just had. Um, the elementary school building committee has uh, reviewed this total project cost and they have approved a range of cost saving measures that reduces that overall cost by about $5 million. In addition, uh, in late 2022, the town successfully advocated to the MSBA for higher reimbursement levels. Uh, the MSBA has caps on what it will reimburse. Uh, we advocated to them uh, saying that because of uh, the extreme escalation in the construction industry, they really need to reconsider those caps. Um, they did not increase them as much as we would have hoped, but they did increase them significantly. And so we believe the benefit of what they have done in terms of increasing the re uh, reimbursement caps uh, will benefit the town somewhere between three and $4 million, um, definitely in excess of 3 million. And we are now preparing for uh, three sets of votes, as, as uh, Paul mentioned. Uh, the date for a special election and what the language will look like. Um, the vote on the language itself requires a two thirds majority because it is related to debt. Uh, and these dates that you see on here are tentative dates, obviously subject to your, your later discussion. Uh, the debt authorization, the next vote would be the debt authorization uh, that the council would vote to fund the project. Um, that's tentatively scheduled for April 3rd. That will also require two thirds majority of the council. And then the actual debt exclusion vote itself um, among uh, town voters. Uh, tentatively scheduled for May 2nd, and that would require a majority of the, the votes cast. Shifting over to project costs. So this is the same project cost summary uh, that was presented to you at your last meeting. Uh, this is what we've based the financing, uh, uh, financing projections that you'll see in a few slides on. Uh, I do wanna note that on uh, Friday's school building committee, uh, the project manager presented a version of this that was slightly higher uh, than what you've saw in the past. Um, and it increased a little bit because they uh, bumped up the estimate for furnishings, equipment, and technology per student. And they also bumped up uh, the estimate for insurance uh, while the 
while the building is being constructed. And so I think it increased to somewhere uh, between two and $300,000 uh, from the number you see here. That won't affect the numbers that you'll see later in this presentation, that's the, the change is not enough um, uh, to in, influence those numbers in, in any material way. Um, but I just did just wanna let you know that you might see a slightly different version of, of this chart at a future uh, future presentation. So how are we gonna pay for the project? Um, we're proposing to borrow money that will be uh, the primary funding source that we would borrow money that would be repaid from additional taxation uh, that would be authorized by the passage of a debt exclusion. Um, the amount of money that we're proposing to borrow, uh, we anticipate will be lower by a couple things. Uh, one, Eversource incentives that we have, um, we've already sent in an MOU uh, to Eversource to participate in an incentive slash rebate program. Uh, we, uh, the estimated value of those incentives is about 1.6 million. And the primary um, element of that that generates that much money is the geothermal aspect of our project. Um, Eversource has a new program that has significant incentives because of the geothermal aspect. And then the second piece that we hope will reduce the borrowing um, if, if approved is the Com Community Preservation Act funding request of 700,000. Um, and again, with that, a group of residents submitted a request um, for this project at Fort River to support the fields next to the project or next to the building. Uh, the CPA committee uh, reviewed that project request and recommended a $700,000 um, uh, appropriation for that project. So those two pieces um, are two things that we believe could reduce the debt authorization if the council, uh, definitely if the council approves the CPA request. Uh, and staff are con staff and others are continuing to explore additional ways to reduce the amount to be borrowed. So these are those ways that you see above are a couple. Um, there's other ways that we're looking into like possible tax credits through the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, there's still more information to come out on that. There's not good regs that tell us exactly what, uh, what we could get, um, but that's something we'll be watching very closely and we'll be uh, pursuing um, as a potential funding source for this. So there's things like that that we will continue to explore as a way to reduce the overall borrowing. Um, we may not know for sure about them though before the decisions uh, that the council and the town have to make. And then lastly, uh, as we move forward uh, with the borrowing, we can structure the debt one of two ways. Actually, Ms. Pam, you asked the question uh, a few moments ago, how there's a couple of different ways you can structure debt. One is level payment, which works like a mortgage um, where you pay the same amount every year. Another way is level principal, where you pay a higher amount in the beginning, and then it trails off a little bit over time. Um, the benefit of the level payment is that you have a lower amount in early years, so you avoid sort of a spike at the beginning um, that could that can be difficult for some people to manage. Um, so what you'll see later in this presentation, we've projected it based on the level payment option to make those early years more manageable. Um, so this next chart, uh, this was provided by our uh, OPM uh, firm, Answer. This is the first um, chart. Uh, the first cash flow chart that you'll see, but it probably won't be the last. This is an early version uh, based on the timeline for the project that maps out um, roughly the, the outlays of cash that the town will have to make for the project. Um, again, I, the specific numbers in here aren't super important, um, but the chart like this will be used with the elementary school building committee to help monitor the project. Um, and what I use it for is to work with our financial advisor to, to look at roughly how much we anticipate using in a given fiscal year, and that uh, directly impacts how much we have to borrow in that particular year. And so what you can see here is that in 2025, 2026, that's when construction will really ramp up um, based on the current timeline and when we would expect most of the um, expenses for the project to occur. And again, you'll, there'll be more updated versions of this as, as we move closer to the actual uh, project beginning. So what is a debt exclusion? Uh, it's a temporary increase in property taxes outside the limits of Proposition 2.5 uh, to pay for the debt service of a particular project. Um, so the keywords there are temporary. It only uh, lasts as long as the debt for that project. So once that project's debt is paid off, the increase goes away. Um, the increase is applied to all taxable properties. Um, and the last time that Amherst did it successfully, at least, or that implemented it, um, at least according to the state's website, was in 1994 uh, for renovations to the regional high school. And we, um, we, the town was actually 
using some of the debt exclusion, probably many people didn't realize it at the time. Um, as recently as 2016, 2017, we were still sort of winding down um, that debt exclusion. So we're gonna look at quickly the language or draft language, language so far. Um, so this first slide shows the ballot question. And so we've reviewed this with our bond council, which, which is a special attorney uh, that the town works with that specifically focuses on debt. Um, and so our bond council has reviewed this, our local legal council has reviewed this, our, the Massachusetts School Building Authority has reviewed it, and the Department of Revenue has reviewed it. All of them were good um, with this language, so we feel pretty confident that this language works. Um, so not to say that there won't be any changes, but um, we think this is uh, ultimately what it's going to be. This next one is the debt authorization financial order, much longer and much smaller font. Um, so this one we have reviewed again with all the same parties. However, this one, there's a little bit of a question um, on some of the language, and it relates to Amherst no longer being a uh, town. Now that we're a city, there's some things that cities, uh, that towns can do that cities can't. And so uh, it, it's not a big issue, but it might mean the language has to change a little bit. So uh, this language could change by the time we, we, we'll make sure that all those parties that I mentioned earlier have signed off on the language before we bring it to you for um, a vote. So we're going to shift to the uh, tax, estimated tax impact. So um, the traditional way to finance a construction project is to use short-term borrowings, which are called bond anticipation notes, and to use those while the project is going on. And then once you use those each year to fund whatever the cost is for that year, whatever you would need. And then at the end of the project, once all the costs are done and you know exactly how much the project costs, you convert all of that, you roll it all together and convert it into a permanent bond. And then you make principal and interest payments on that bond. And while you're using the short-term financings, you only have to pay interest on, on what you borrow in those early years. Um, so that's a traditional way to do it. Um, it's a conservative way to do it. And that's what um, the numbers that you'll see on the next slide are based on. Um, there's another way to do it that we will uh, keep open if interest rates are, are in a good place. And that is if when the project begins, if interest rates are really low or much lower than where they are now, it may make sense for us to do a permanent financing earlier to lock in a lower interest rate earlier. So there's some tools at our disposal to try to uh, take advantage of, of lower interest rates and get a better uh, deal for the town. But what we've presented tonight, we'll see on the next slide is based on the more conservative option. Uh, so the current financing plan projects interest only payments that would begin in 2025 and then uh, principal and interest payments that would begin in 2029. Uh, the financing plan assumes a level of debt payment structure, as I mentioned before. And so the additional taxation that would come from the debt exclusion, so when it starts impacting taxpayers, that would begin in 2025, and it would be for those interest-only payments on the short-term financings that I mentioned. Those would ramp up a little bit each year until 2029 when we would start our principal and interest payments. And at that point, it would stay fixed for until 2054. So again, with this level payment, we would ramp up and then we'd get to a, fi a, a certain point where it would stay fixed pretty much for the life of the debt. And so what you'll see on the next slide is that fixed point, that maximum of where it's going to be for the majority of the, the debt exclusions life. But just know that um, before 2029, it would ramp up a little bit, it would ramp up um, slowly to get to that point. And then the last thing is uh, the debt, uh, the charts on the next slide that we're going to show you, they, it already incorporates CPA funds and Eversource rebates. So that's um, based on a, a borrowing of about $53, $54 million, um, which already incorporates the CPA and the Eversource rebate. So if the CPA funds are not approved, we would have to back that out. All right, so this uh, chart shows the impacts. Um, there's a little link at the top here um, that anybody can click. It brings you to a, a tool on the state's website. That's where this information comes from. Um, and what that tool does is it allows you to put in the annual, um, the annual debt cost and then pick Amherst and it pops out the numbers basically for what the impacts will be. Um, so if anybody wants to look at any other towns or look, look at Amherst and play around with different things, they could. Uh, but what this shows you, that top little table shows you our current tax rate, which is $20.10 per thousand. The 
first line in the next table where it says proposed tax rate impact per thousand, a dollar seven is the estimated impact of the debt exclusion uh, per thousand. So um, for every thousand dollars of assessed value, you'd multiply it by a dollar seven to figure out the um, debt exclusion impact for that, uh, that property on an annual basis. So if you go down to the third line in that second table, uh, the average single family assessed value in Amherst in FY23 is 446,953. And then if you skip down to the last line in that, that table, um, the estimated impact from the debt exclusion if it was passed uh, is $478 for an average uh, single family home. And then the table at the very bottom just gives you a range of different assessed values so you can see the impact at different levels. So again, if you wanted to get more refined and look up a specific value, um, you would just uh, you'd identify the assessed value for that property, divide it by 1,000, and then multiply it by the dollar seven, and that would give you the estimated debt exclusion impact for that property. So what can change um, or what can change the numbers on the prior slide? So the overall cost of the project, uh, just like we just heard with Centennial, um, project costs are not set until uh, we go out for construction bids, um, which in this case wouldn't happen until uh, somewhere closer to the second half of 2024. Um, so again, we've included a placeholder for cost escalation, but construction bids could come in higher, could come in lower, and that would could change the um, the overall amount that we would have to borrow. The uh, projected interest rate could change. We've seen interest rates go, uh, go up and down in recent years. That would impact the annual debt service. Uh, the timing of expending funds, if we expend more earlier on, we might have to borrow more um, in early, uh, do more short-term borrowings in the beginning of the project, so that could change it. Um, the tax base of Amherst is one that has a big impact on the numbers. So if the ta tax base continues to grow, um, the way it has the past five to seven years, the numbers on the prior side will likely come down. Um, as we grow the tax base and as new properties come on, that helps spread out the burden of the debt exclusion. And so again, if we have another period of growth like we had the last um, five to seven years, um, I would expect those numbers could be quite a bit lower when we actually go out to do the debt exclusion or when we actually go out to borrow the money. And then uh, the anticipated reimbursement from the MSBA. So they'll give us a maximum grant amount, but the final MSBA reimbursement is based on the cost that we submit and what they deem eligible and ineligible. Um, and then the last big thing that could change is the availability of other funding sources. So if we're successful in finding some other um, offsets for the cost of the project, that would obviously reduce the total amount we'd have to borrow um, and could reduce uh, the impacts of the debt exclusion. So next steps, we'll review this in detail in more detail with the Finance Committee tomorrow um, and also later in the month on the 28th. And we'll continue to update um, all these numbers and the, this plan as uh, market conditions change and as more information comes, uh, comes from the project as it gets developed further. And happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Sean. I, I don't want to say you make it sound easy, but you make it sound understandable. Maybe that's the best way. Um, we're going to start with questions. Dorothy. Um, is there any kind of uh, way for a, a, a low income senior who lives in a house whose value has increased, but their income has not increased? Um, is there any kind of um, help for that when we have a debt exclusion? So I think the first thing we'd want them to do is meet with our assessor's office and just see if they're um, taking advantage of everything they might be entitled to. I think that would be the first step. We have some exemptions already in place. I think we'd want to look there first and make sure that they're taking advantage of those if they qualify. Okay, thank you. Questions? Michelle Miller? I have a question um, about so funding the project, um, I think that we're, it's, it's important that the town show its commitment to the project, but also that we try to reduce the burden um, to the taxpayer as much as possible. So I am wondering if the finance committee is going to explore the possibility of using reserve funds. Um, and I, I didn't have a chance before our meeting tonight to 
look at our financial sort of regulations that the town has or the policies, but I do remember as a prior member of the finance committee talking about reserves um, being used for our capital projects. And I know we have quite a reserve. I think it's maybe 24 million. So uh, just wondering if there are any plans to allocate some of that or to, to explore allocating some of that money um, for this project. Yeah, so I think the, the first thing of what you said about lowering the costs, um, I, I think you're right. That's our goal is to continue to try to find ways to lower the cost. Um, so far, we've been able to lower the cost by about ten million dollars from where it would have you know where it started. So, so the you know there's been different factors that have contributed to that, um, but it has dropped quite a bit. I think when it comes to reserves, the one thing we have to keep in mind is that our overall goal is to complete four building projects. Um, that's the goal of the council is to get four building projects completed, and those reserves play a really critical role um, in some of the other projects. So. I think it's something that the finance committee will obviously discuss, but I just I think that's the context we have to keep in mind is that our goal is still to move all four building projects to completion, um, you know, as quickly as we can. Other questions from the council? Yes, Shalini. Um, yes, one I wanted to just say that I'm happy to hear that there is a possibility of a tax base increases if. Uh, there are other sources of funding that show up that this could go down. So that's encouraging for all of us. Um, the question I had was about the language for um, the ballot question. It seems really legal and hard to understand. Like even as counselors, I mean, we know what that inclusion, uh, exclusion is and proposition to an half is, but I wonder if there's a way to with this legal language, but then also explain in simpler language to people who don't know all this. So the language that goes on the ballot is prescribed by state law. You have to, you, you can't put a number in there, which is what's always frustrating oh. to people. It says, shall the debt be excluded from the limits of proposition two and a half, and it doesn't show a number. And so you're not allowed to put other words in there other than what the state law prescribes. So that will require us to do an immense amount of education for people to fully understand what that includes. And so a lot of towns have passed debt exclusions. They've all faced the same hurdle and they've all, we've all in, attempted to educate the public as best they can so people know what they're voting on. But it is a challenge because the, the language is written specifically by the state law. And just building off of what Paul said, yeah, when you read that question, you might not know whether to vote yes or no to get the outcome that you want, right? So I think we have to make it very clear what a yes vote means and what a no vote means um, so that there's no yeah, confusion. Mandy Jo? Yeah, this may be a little technical, but um, when you were talking about what can affect that tax increase if the debt is excluded, you talked about the tax base increases. Um, the chart you showed had a tax increase of 1.07, right? Mm -hmm. Once that number's set, does that stay the same the whole 30 years? Or as the tax base increases by year 30, presumably we'll have added a, a larger tax base. It, it doesn't stay the same. So does that number fluctuate such that in year 30, whatever amount on our level payment we're paying is now spread out over more? Or do you just pay it off earlier because you took in more from every tax? I hope that's a clear question yeah no no it'll we expect that number will slowly decline as the tax base grows um every year as we um look at the tax base and we calculate that the debt will stay fixed but the tax base will grow so it'll it'll um dilute the impact a little bit each year as we go forward alicia um thank you lynn so i think most of what i was wondering was already asked, but I'm going to ask just for further elaboration. Um, and so going back to Shalini's question in terms of the ballot question and the wording, I'm wondering, is there specific criteria that needs to be followed for that question to be written? And is there another way to further simplify the question? Because to me, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are other uh, criteria that has to be met aside from what Paul just said, but like just because we can't say numbers doesn't mean we can't simplify what is being 
written a little bit more because I agree that it's very hard to understand. And I think people are going to have hesitation in voting for something that they cannot understand. I can barely understand that just reading it. And so I would really, really strongly encourage us to continue to look at that and find better wording. Yeah, so we can obviously, we'll obviously look at that. This language comes specifically from the MSBA, both this language and the debt authorization language um, comes from a template that they provide. And there's a couple pieces of information that we put in. Uh, we put in the, the city known as the town of Amherst, um, and then the section around the elementary school uh, for River site located at Southeast Street. Um, but this and same thing with the debt authorization, most of the language is from a, an MSBA approved template. Um, we can, again, we can reach out to see if there's ways to simplify it, but a lot of it is very uh, directly tied to the, the law and what it, um, in a certain way you have to ask the question. And so the template is the only way that it can be written. Like there is no other way to write it while still meeting whatever required criteria there is. Um, because I know like in other situations, I don't know much about writing ballot questions that a template is usually provided for assistance, but it's not usually the only way to do something. And so I'm wondering if we can still find a different way to approach it while still meeting all of the criteria required by law for the ballot question. Yeah, the state law actually prescribes the exact language that should be on, except for the specifics about our community. But we can explore what any if, if anybody has done anything better than that, because I think everyone has always agreed that that language is very challenging for the voters to understand. And you are all educated uh, as uh, elected officials, and it's harder for just regular people going to the ballot. But the fact is that the state law, and I can share this with you, is a very explicit about what has to what the words have to be on the ballot itself. Thank you, Paul. Um, sorry if I bite, I just have one other question, but also I would just continue to encourage to look into that more if that's possible. Um, and then my second comment was again about the uh, trying to figure out what else we can do as a town to sort of reduce the um, the burden that's going to fall onto the taxpayers. Um, and I think it's great that we've been able to come down so much, but just coming down, like we're still looking at an increase in the tax bracket that this town falls within is already difficult where we are right this minute. And so looking at any kind of increase is difficult for not only, you know, people who may live here already and have a hard time paying the taxes, but people who may want to move here. Um, and so I'm wondering and hoping that we can explore further options into reducing that debt service to the taxpayers. Jennifer? Uh, yeah, so continuing on uh, Shalini and Alicia's questions. Uh, please use your mic. Oh, yeah, can you hear? Um, I did, what, what I wanted to ask is in, if we don't have that much flexibility or leeway with the language on the ballot, have we ever literally sent out a mailing? I don't know if there's a tax bill or something going out before that would reach almost every resident in Amherst explaining the language, I mean, you know, the counselors, we can all send, you know, emails and mailings to our district mailing lists, but those are not, you know, going to, you know, it's the way much limit, more limited than the entire town. But is there some way to be able to explain what's being asked mm -hmm. that would reach everyone? Yeah. Paul, do you want to go and then yeah. I'm going to call in Kathy? Sure. So there's a fine line. Um, be, the town can't use public resources to advocate for or against the ballot question. We can do educational material for people, um, but we we can't use public resources to say vote yes on this project. Um, but we can say this is the impact on the project. Um, I, I'd have to look into what if other communities have used public resources to do mailings. Um, we can certainly share information sort of like what we've just done here, but ultimately it would be advocacy groups either for or against the, the ballot question who would lobby the voters to vote one way or the other. But is there a way, I don't know if we just notify voters when and where the election will be, what, you know, say this is the question on the ballot and what it is asking is this. So they know. Yeah, so we can certainly educate them. voters that there's an election coming up that there's a question on the ballot, what the question is, all those types of things is, is actually, I think, our duty to educate voters that there is an election that they should, part they, they should have the opportunity to participate in. 
Athena, you had a comment, and then I'm going to Kathy. Thanks. I just wanted to note that the there's a memo from the Office of Campaign and Political Finance in your packet from last the last meeting, and that has good instructions about what elected officials are and aren't allowed to do in terms of advocating. So you're not allowed to use town resources um, for advocating for the ballot question. Speak into your mic. Okay. okay. Uh, Kathy. Uh, thank you. So I, I just want to speak to this and I will do a little bit of work to see what other towns have done for their schools. But if you remember the complicated language we had this last election on sometimes you had no idea what you were voting on, but you got those little red booklets and they had a for and against, but they also just said, if you vote yes, this means, if you vote no, this means. So what I want to see, Paul, is when people did mailings about special elections for debt exclusion, did anyone just do something simple like this? Here's the language you're going to see. A yes means this, a no means that, um, rather than saying, we love our school and we want it. <laughs> um, but but really, really very neutral. Um, and. And I know another part of this, Lynn, is mail-in vote versus other, you know, what we're deciding. So if we're going to have to mail something out to households anyway to let them know that this is happening, you know, even if we're not doing mail-in. So I've seen several towns have gone out recently for their schools, um, and they have done what you've said, Paul. They've been very careful not to advocate, but they've said you're going to see this on the ballot. So I just want to see whether they mailed it, you know, whether that they mailed it to every registered voter or not. Okay, Anika. We can't. I imagine the answer to my question is no, because it seems uh, so simple, but is it possible at all to just have some sort of insert or something that accompanies the ballot um, that is not advocating, but just simply explaining what the vote means? I, I think that's the thing that Kathy was talking about, and we can explore that, what's what's permitted under the law. Again, if we're using public resources, we cannot advocate for or against a matter like this. We can educate, but not advocate. Anna? Yeah. I'm, and, little... I'm sorry, Anika, were you finished? Yes, thank you. Okay, Anna? Thank you. Um, I'm just, I'm a little confused. Every ballot measure I've seen in the past has a summary and then has a yes vote on this question means a no vote on this question means why would we not be able to do that for a debt exclusion vote? Again, the debt exclusion language is explicit in the state law. Of, of the measure, but yeah. is there is there, and I can, I guess, go look at the state law, but is there a reason why we can't have the summary section below as we, with other ballot measures? We can check with the town attorney on that. Okay. I think we're limited on what we can put on the actual ballot though. Okay. And, and when I was just saying that it was in usually, I call them the red booklets, the, when we have more of them, but it wasn't actually on the ballot itself. It was just, you, there was a red booklet somewhere. So you could say, what am I voting on here? Um, right. So that's, that's the issue because those actually came out of the state usually. Um, well, it's on the warrant itself too. I think what the answer is, we'll be exploring that. Uh, Anna, anything else at this point? Nope. Okay. Uh, Dorothy? Uh, I personally think the biggest difficulty will be getting out the vote. It's a special election. And I think that anyone who actually goes to the polls will probably know what the issue is. Um, when you have a special election, uh, what's this, in May or April or sometime, uh, it's not a time people are used to voting. So, I mean, you're, you're aware that our district councilors do not are not given uh, email lists and our lists are just things that we've been able to put together they're very spotty they're all kinds of people who we do not communicate with at all because we don't have their email address so i'm i think that in terms i'd be concentrating on getting out the vote and um i think in the past i've asked we do we have like electric sign that goes at the intersection that could say voting today with the hours um, cause I think people who might even intend to vote, who know what they're going to vote for, understand the language will still not remember that this is a day you have to vote. So I, I, I just think we're gonna have to really work to remind people today's the day, go to the polls and, and to help. So do we have that kind of signage of availability to remind them exactly when the voting is open? This we is do have, we do have electric, electronic signs that we can put up that, um, that can notify people. There are other signs that we're allowed to to put out and say vote today, that, that type of thing. And I noticed that town clerk Suadet has her hand up. Right. 
I'm going to go to Sue. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, yes, I've already gotten permission to use the electronic sign from the police department. So it's just a matter of uh, giving them dates. Um, this is something we've looked at through the years and it's finally come to fruition. Plus, we have a lot of uh, lawn type signs that we can put out. Um, so I just wanted to confirm that. Okay. Andy? Yeah, I just wanted to remind everyone that this isn't the first time we've ever done this. So we know the experience of using this language and um, going to the voters and the voters have understood and devoted um, in an appropriate fashion for them. The 2018 um, override, which did pass for the schools, as you remember, the elementary school failed because of town meeting deciding not to borrow the funds, uh, but the, the voters had passed an override before and the override language was virtually identical. I, I examined it a couple of weeks ago and compared. Um, it seems to me that uh, to an extent we have already discussed the debt authorization and the debt exclusion. Uh, so I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about the special election day, which we've tentatively set at May 2nd, the early voting dates, if we're going to do that, and locations and mail-in ballots. This is a discussion only. So if we could focus on just one at a time. The first question is, are there questions about the May 2nd date? We've discussed it once before. Uh, Kathy. I like the date. And what I would really like to know when you said we're not voting on it, the sooner we can vote on the date, uh, people, this education campaign, it's hard to say, it's tentatively set for May 2nd. You know, I want people to start circling it in their calendar. Right. So so um, I know it works, the colleges are still in session. Um, it's there to the extent they're gonna be voting in our election, um, trying to get out the vote. So, I, so that's my only question about it, Lynn. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I personally don't want it to be later than that. Is the other the if other if it's later than that the um higher ed institutions will be starting into exams or be out and that is not appropriate because it's not just the students but it's the faculty and the staff who aren't um around as much during the summer so um i i agree with kathy that it the sooner we come to full agreement may 2nd is the date the better um pam you have a question on yeah, that? Yeah, is there any budget cycle reason for a particular date? No, this was, I did a lot of examining of calendars and it, I didn't, I mean, May 1st is when the town manager gives us his budget, uh, but it's not, those two aren't related intimately at this point. Okay. So, the, let me just introduce the early voting dates. Usually that's for about a week before the um, election date. Uh, and that would be that would begin the week uh, in April. It would be right after students and their parents in K to 12 come back from spring break. So that they would be back, you know, starting school that Monday that you would do a week of early voting, it, which is also the reason to wait till May 2nd. Mandy Jo? Um, yeah, I wanna make sure that if, if we do early voting and I support that, that at least one day during the week is on UMass's campus, because I think that's gonna be hugely important to the um, people who spend most of their time on UMass's campus, especially with our redistricted districts where most students are in all of the districts. We don't have a concentrated and we don't want students or faculty to have to sort of location hop on the day of the election because they went to the wrong location to vote. Whereas if we do early voting on campus, they're at the right location no matter what. Okay. Um, I do want to um, see if there's any further 
comments or questions about the date or the early voting dates. So they would begin on Monday, I, April 25th. April 25th, thank you. Um, it's the 24th. Okay. 24th. This is a Tuesday, Eight, so Monday, April 24th. 24th. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember, um, Mandy Joe, I think it might have been you, that we specifically asked that there also be one evening of early voting um, that in this last election. Is that, am I correct about that? Sue, you're still in the audience. Am I correct? I'm here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, I didn't, well, I haven't heard that, but. Um... Can I speak a little bit about Please. the early voting? Sue, so, so you, can you turn your camera on? Um, hold on one second. If not, that's okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Is it working? It's working. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so just a few statistics. I've just started to work, work up um, comparing in-person early voting with mail-in balloting. And um, in 2018, when we did not have the mail-in balloting, we had about a 25% turnout for in-person early voting, pretty standard. Uh, the minute the mail-in balloting option came about, this last round, September and November, we had about a 7 8% turnout in the in-person early voting as opposed to about a 50% for the mail-in ballot. So you can see where the shift is. Um, it's gone over to the mail-in ballot and the, the you know, interest in the mail, the uh, in-person early voting has gone down, 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 down. In fact, um, the Secretary of State's office is exploring shortening the term of the mail, the, I'm sorry, I keep getting the, the name mixed up, um, shortening the time for state elections for in-person early voting down to one week instead of two because of the lack of interest statewide. So just, just some interesting um, facts out that are, that are, you know, have happened as a result of the mail-in balloting. So and we're saying we do early voting for two weeks usually? Not for a town election, only for a state. Okay. Yeah. Town okay. and primaries are roughly one week. Okay. And it makes yeah. sense. I mean, the, the well, yeah. if we went to two weeks, that first of the two weeks, the K to 12 families might not even be in town. Um, right, Anne? Yeah. Right. Okay. Kathy, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah. Um, so I, I just thinking through this is a special election and you want people not to forget. So I think one of the things early voting does, especially if we have the flashes up, you know, you can vote anytime this week. Um, you don't have to remember to put something in the mail. You don't have to, rem you can just walk in and vote. So I, I'm agreeing with Mandy, if we can do at least one of those at UMass. I think people, like they come downtown and go, oh, I can vote. And it's just incredibly convenient. And the other piece about it is you don't have to remember where you're supposed to vote. You, there's just one place to vote, which is a really nice convenient. And with the change in districts, um, the the actual day of voting, there are going to be still some people wondering whether they're going to the up in ours, which of our two churches you go to, or do I go here? Mm -hmm. So I would argue for the early voting. I just don't know whether we need a full week of it. I just think it makes it really convenient for people to remember. Um, I, I, would, I can't see us doing less than a week. I think we want to provide every opportunity to get people to the polls. Um, so we're talking about early voting. Sue, did you want to discuss the issue of early voting on the UMass campus? Well, like every decision that I make, I like to do a, you know, pro versus a con list, mm -hmm. um, benefits versus the detriments. Um, I still need some time to explore that. You know, um, past experience has not been good. We've had bad um, you know, unreliable workers that we've put up there, or, um, you know, it, it takes one of us leaving the office to set it up. We can't just trust it to anybody because as chief election specialist, one of us has to be there to make sure everything is, is the way it needs to be. And, you know, now that in, uh, now that mail-in ballots is a thing, the amount of 
time on our office for how you know getting things done has astronomically expanded. It's one way to put it. We're stretched thin. So you know, and I just think I know there's about 250 um, registered voters. That's just students. I'm not talking about staff, which represents about two percent of the voting population in Amherst. It's not very high. So I mean, this is all stuff that I'm considering and weighing my decision. Town clerk does pick, yeah, town clerk does pick the location, but I have to think, is it worth it? You know, that's the bottom line. Is it worth the effort? Um, these costs, the cost for mailing the ballots, that's one side. The cost for doing early voting is another side. For town elections, they're unfunded mandates, so it's all on the town. So, you know, I'm conscious of the cost. I'm always trying to keep things down, but I know we want to have as many voters come out and vote. So it's one of those things where, you know, I've got my list, <laughs> pro, con. So I will continue to explore. And I'll, I'll listen to your feedback and take that all into consideration as well, as I always try to do. Thank you. Dorothy. Um, I remember standing outside of the UMass for voting, uh, probably 2018, and nobody went in and and the few people that did in went in didn't vote do, do you have the figures of how many when from the last time we had voting on the umass campus how many votes were actually cast i would in my files in the office which i can take up yeah okay. because it was really it was very i realized it was a waste of my time but i spent a lot of time standing out there and there was just nobody going in and nobody voting I was on a day where lots of people voted, Dorothy. So we, we were just on different days. Yep. Anna? I apologize for backtracking a little bit, but I um, wanted to know the answer to my question really definitively, and I did find it. So I want to clarify for other folks in case they find it interesting. Um, and I sent the links to Athena if, if folks are interested in them. Um, KP Law has a document about Prop 2.5 override ballot questions, and it specifically states, the law does not authorize a summary to be included on the ballot in connection with any such ballot question. So no summary, no yes vote means, no vote means. That has to be done by other mailing. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, just not on the ballot. Right. Okay, so we're still at this point. What I'm hearing from people is, uh, we're not voting tonight, but what I'm hearing is that when we bring this back, we are in fact looking at May 5th. We are looking at early voting date, I'm sorry, May 2nd, May 2, May 2. <laughs> Thank you. Woo. Um, we are looking at one week of early voting uh, at both at town hall with the possibility of on the Amherst campus, UMass Amherst campus, and we are looking at mail-in ballots because of the success that we have seen since the state elections began using those during COVID. One of the down upsides, if you will, of COVID is we learned how to do mail-in voting. Um, are there any other comments before we move on to a break? Yes, Michelle. I just wanted to say that uh, May 2nd is National Teachers Day this year. So that's kind of a cool, <laughs> a it's cool day. It's National Teachers national Day. National Geek. Okay. Teacher's Day. No, no Teacher's Day. Thank you. All right. Not Geek Day. Teacher's Day. Some, some, some teachers are geeks, and those are really good teachers. It, it um, may help us all remember in the community yeah, uh, what we're, we're doing. So. That one I didn't find on the calendar when I looked. <laughs> um, Kathy? So if, if we have those three options, then I don't need an answer now, but Sue was talking about mailing costs and I'll do a fundraiser if we need to for mailing costs. But if we wanna let everyone know you have three ways of voting, which was, we were all told last time by mail that, and here is it, here's what's gonna be on the ballot and here's an explanation of it. Right. That one mailing could go out and people would know that piece of it, right? There is a, yes. That well, then wait. You're saying that that one mailing can go out from the town. I think we have to check on that. Could that mailing go out from others? Yes. Okay. You know, as long as we have a list of registered voters, right? Yep. Although I do recall that when we would get our mail in ballot applicate things that we had to then apply, 
it would have that kind of information on it. It's been, you know, since last fall, so I don't have clear memory of it. Okay. Are there any other questions? Kathy? Okay. Okay. Sue, thanks for joining us. Thanks for your support of the upcoming election and all of our elections and other town clerk responsibilities. Could, um, Paul? I just want to mention that Sue was recently earned the designation of certified municipal clerk. Yes. Which is a big oh. achievement. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It, it, it takes years to achieve that going to lots of classes. And she is now mentoring the assistant town clerk to follow the same path. So credit to Sue for encouraging that professional development. But it takes a lot of time and effort and study to achieve. It's not just an automatic thing. So congrats to Sue for that. Congratulations, Thank you very much. Sue. Terrific. Actually, it was Thank you. It actually was more work than my bachelor's degree. I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. Probably more tests involved. Oh. Okay. With All right, that, thank you. Uh, we are going to take a 10 minute break. You've deserved this. Uh, and we will be back at um, 817. <laughs> please unmute, please mute and turn your cameras off. And when you come back, turn your cameras back on. Thank you.
We need to start gathering again, please. Oh, ignore me, totally, 100%, 100% ignore me. It's an important, we're debating the official candy of the state and the official sandwich. We just said you don't have to tell me. Okay, please turn on your video so that I know you're back. Okay, we're going to move on to our next agenda item, which is the proposal brought forward for special legislation for um, non-citizen voting. And this is sponsored by Pat and Shalini. We've already voted to refer to GOL. So there will not be no vote at the end of the um, discussion, but the floor is open. I'm going to start by asking Pat and Shalini if there are some things that they would like to say. Yes, thank you, Lynn. Um, can you folks hear me? We can. Okay. Uh, if approved by the state legislature, the town of Amherst would be authorized to allow lawful, lawful permanent residents to register and vote in local elections. Um, lawful permanent residents are non-citizens who are lawfully authorized to live permanently within the United States. They may accept the offer of employment without special restrictions, own property, receive financial assistance at public colleges and universities, and join the armed forces. We, um, to have a, uh, where, <laughs> I'm a little, okay. Uh, to have a voice in Amherst, you need to be able to vote. To have a voice anywhere, you need to be able to vote. Throughout American history, every disenfranchised group has achieved greater social and civil rights by attaining and maintaining the right to vote. Why should non-citizens in Amherst who work just as hard support our schools fire police and press departments with their tax dollars, and even risk their lives serving in our military be denied the right to vote on local issues. According to the 2020 census, Amherst has 6,890 born, foreign born residents, of which 4,249 are not US citizens. This comes to 61% um, of all for, foreign born residents and a little more than 10% of all our residents. They own property, they pay local, state, and federal taxes, send their children to public schools, belong to churches, mosques, and synagogues, serve on town committees and boards. They bring greater racial, ethnic, linguistic, and cultural diversity to our town. They deserve a meaningful voice. They deserve the right to vote on local issues that directly affect them their families, their property, and businesses. Over the course of our history as a nation, there has been both expansion and uh, contraction around the idea of non-citizen voting. Uh, in Amherst, however, in the 1990s, we started to look as a town at non-citizen or uh, lawful permanent resident voting. And we have consistently over time uh, forwarded special act requests to the state legislature. And in each uh, town meeting vote, the majority of people supporting this have grown. Um, we are part of a collection of towns in the uh, state of Massachusetts who are coming together, who have requested this before and who are coming together now and with support of, of Joe Comerford and Mindy Dom to really push and shepherd this special act through the state legislature. Um, that's all I have to say for the moment, but I'd like Shalene to share her personal story. Shalene? Yeah, thank you, Pat. So I just wanted to speak more from a personal perspective. Uh, as many of you know, I'm an immigrant from India. And uh, what I don't know if many people know is that it requires a big sacrifice for us immigrants to earn the right to be here today, the right to vote, because the sacrifice is we have to give up our citizenship in, in our native countries. So I had to give up my Indian citizenship 
in order to earn a citizenship here. And that was the reason why, even though I was here in 2001 and earned the right to be a citizen, I kept postponing, but it was really hard uh, to give up my own country citizenship. So that's one block uh, obstacle that many immigrants have. They have to make that choice, that difficult choice. And, uh, and there are so many other obstacles for immigrants in terms of it's a very lengthy, involved process, very complicated paperwork. And so I can read and write English and I could do it, but many people have to hire lawyers and there's a lot of cost involved. So meanwhile, you know, th that's one reason many people don't end up choosing to be citizen. But meanwhile, we uh, lose out on um, their, um, I mean, they lose out on the, the opportunity to vote. And as uh, Pat shared, and as uh, uh, others have shared today. Um, and I think one other thing that I wanted to say was, I think for me, and I know for others, the biggest uh, sh change that this brings is a sense of belonging. So once we're allowed to vote, and we have the right to vote is when we really feel that sense of belonging in a town, we contribute, like as I have in the last five years or four years, I've been part of council. So we're really losing out while it's not fair to the people, but it's also not good for the town because we're losing out on the opportunities. Um, of, the town is losing out on the skills and gifts of so many immigrants who could be more involved in our town. So I really hope that um, our council, I have no doubt, will support it. And I'm really uh, also want to say that having spoken with state rep Mindy Dom, she is supporting this and Hopefully we'll keep doing it till the state passes it. So thank you for your support. Uh, quickly, just wanna thank um, Rizvan Sibi who's here today and who is one of the persons critical for my jumping into this. Also wanna thank Michelle who started working on this issue with Pat before I jumped in, so. Okay. Thank you. So the floor is open for questions or comments. Anna. I'm so excited about this. Um, I think it's great. And I think my questions are a little specific in terms of understanding why the language is crafted the way it is. Um, and so I had looked up a couple other towns who have submitted similar home rules um, across the state. And I think one of the things that I am curious about is why the language of um, have their name entered on a list of voters versus shall be considered registered voters. Um, and I, I think the reason my rationale for that is that there's more than just voting in any election for a local office or local ballot questions. It also would, if they are considered eligible voters by the town on a local level, they could then, as per our charter, run for elected office, and which you just mentioned, but also signing petitions, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I, I'm curious. Uh, I want to make sure that that's very clear to people that it's it's not just election. And I know this is what you're, I believe this is what you intended, that it's not just, you know, election day and early voting and mail-in voting, but it's also could run for local office, such as um, school committee or town council uh, or trust Jones library trustee, et cetera, or, and, or can sign local um, petitions and, and uh, warrants and such. What you're saying is critically important, Anna, and um, that bypassed us, I think. Um, I think it would be uh, uh, certainly um, fine with me, and I think with Shalane, but she can speak for herself, to amend the language in that way in the special act. And I know this is going GOL, so I guess I, I will, I will um, pass my comments as... Yeah, no, um, that would be very helpful, and thank you for that. As chair of GOL, Pat, I feel like I'm, I'm passing those on to you now. <laughs> okay. Are there any other comments or questions? Pam. I support this too. I, I actually thought we'd already passed this a number of years ago. We have. So, <laughs> yeah. so it just never got to the legislature. Is that the- No, issue? the legislature never yeah. acted. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's not completely true. It has passed uh, state committees, uh, the election committees, the language was certified, um, and it never seems to get past coming out of committee. Uh, and what the difference for us now is there seems to be 
a commitment by other communities to reapply with us. And there's also a direct commitment from our state senator and our state rep to really shepherd this and push this. There's 100% support behind it, which we haven't had before. Yeah, because it seems that Amherst itself is ready for this, but and has wanted it for some time. Right. It's voted on it a minimum of four times at each time it has passed town meeting uh, and gone forward and then failed to uh, get passed by the state legislature. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? Then this will be a referral and is going to GOL. GOL next meets on the 15th. 15th. Yes. Okay. Could uh, I say one thing not related to this, but um, I'm going to uh, leave the meeting now. Uh, I'm in pain and I, I really can't uh, sit through more of it, but I needed to sit here for this. And I thank you for your support. I think, well, we're going to vote now to, re no, we voted to refer it. All right. Thank you, folks. Thanks. Good luck, Pat. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we are going to go on to public way long-term reservation request Amherst Farmers Market. It was pulled from the agenda. I mean, from the consent agenda. Pam, you were asked. You asked to pull this. Could you please speak to your uh, request? Yes. My very quick question was, um, where would the powwow be held? Um, if there is somehow a potential conflict with the farmer supply, uh, farmer, farmer supply, farmer's, farmer's market. market. Thank you. Paul, you've sure. been in discussion with them. Yes, I have with both the farmer's market and uh, with the Odenong tribe. Um, so the tribe came in or last fall to reserve the common, um, knowing that the, um, the farmer's market also was going to be interested in it. We have promised the Odenong tribe the entire South Common. Um, and uh, in talking with the farmer's market, they are okay with relocating to the Spring Street lot um, for that one day. Um, but the Odenong tribe is, is considering whether they even need the space that the farmer's market typically uses. So they're, they have not had their committee meeting, but they will. And you know they will let us know if they are, can free up that space for the farmer's market to be where it normally is, or um, if they're going to be utilizing the entire common. And last year, several of us attended it and was at the high school. They moved it to the high school. And fortunately, it was a good decision for them because it was raining. It that was day. a terribly rain. But they really day. would prefer to be on the common. Yeah. Right. Any other questions or comments? Mandy Jo? Yep. Um, I just want to support the um, work you do to allow other concurrent uses. Um, I was going to pull this from consent because I had had a concern from the um, garden club, but when they saw the plan this year, they're pretty sure that they can still mm -hmm. do it next year, but I want to just put my support out there for not just the powwow, but all those concurrent uses to make sure that we can continue to use the common yeah. concurrently like that. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is a long motion. Uh, but let me make it look for a second to approve the Amherst Farmers Market long term event use reservation of the South Common and associated parking spaces at no charge under town council policy re re regarding the control and regulation of the public way as follows on Saturdays from 730 a.m. to 130 p.m. beginning on April 22nd, 2023 and ending on November 18th, 2023. Exclusive use of the area on the South Common as shown on the plan entitled Amherst Farmers Market Proposed Layout 2022 Season. I think that needs to say 2023 season. January 27th, 2023. I'm amending the motion. Uh, for vendor parking, allocation of 15 spaces on the Spring Street lot and six spaces on Boltwood Avenue. And for customer curbside pickup only to be Clearly marked by the Amherst Farmers Market, five spaces on South Pleasant Street, and to further authorize the town manager the ability to modify the approval through November 19th, 2023, in order to schedule concurrent use of the town common for short term use, event use. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Lynn? Yes. Um, the 
the um, layout is dated 2022. It's okay. the same layout. So it's the same layout as last year. It's Thank you. Then I stand it corrected. Correct. And it, the motion is correct as printed on the motion sheet. All right. Seeing no further comments, we're going to move to a vote. I believe we are going to start with Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Uh, Michelle Miller. Aye. Pam, uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmill. Yes. And Patty Angelis is absent. It is unanimous uh, with 12 people here and one absent. Okay. Uh, we are going to move on to appointments. Uh, there are no town, town manager appointments. However, um, once the council appointments were made for committees, um, Anna Devlin Gothier chose to resign from the Joint Capital Planning Committee. I subsequently asked the full council if anybody was interested in the third position on JCPC. I received two responses. Those two responses were from Mandy Jo Haneke and from Dorothy Pam, who said, if needed, if, is there anybody else at this time who would like to put their name forward for JCPC? Okay. Uh, Mandy Jo, is there any comment you'd like? Uh, Ma Anna, please go ahead. Oh, I was just going to make a motion, so I never mind. Okay. Kathy? I do, is the if needed, Dorothy, do you definitely want to be on it or is are we really talking about Mandy? And it's just we meet this Thursday and then we meet every Thursday. So from one to three, that's the schedule that so this is imminently started. Uh, yes, I would like to do it. So, But is this going to be a, a vote between the two of us? As it's, long as you're both in the in. Yes. OK. Okay. Are there any other people who are interested in serving on JCPC? Michelle? I'm not interested. I just wanted to ask a clarifying question um, since we were going to have a vote on this is um, just to say, Mandy and Dorothy, have either of you served on this committee previously uh, in either of your terms? Um, I have not, but I was on the finance committee for many years. So, um, and I certainly heard many reports on it. And I had kind of wanted to be on the finance committee again, and that did not work out. So I thought, well, this would be something good to do because I'm very interested in the uh, the matters. Yeah, but, uh, hey, thank you. That's helpful. Mandy Joe. Um, if my memory serves me correctly, I believe I've been on JCPC for the last four years, but it might only be three. I'm blanking on the first year of the council's term. Yeah, I, I know I was on for the first year and that was it. Shalini. <clears throat> who, who are the other members on JCPC? Um, Pam Bruni and Kathy Shane. And we voted that um, very beginning of January. Okay, Anna. Sure. So I had, um, Dorothy, I apologize. I had interpreted the as needed um, differently. So I appreciate you clarifying. I'd really love to hear from both Mandy and Dorothy about their interest in the committee since uh, they're both, if they are both interested in the position, I'd love to hear more from each of them regarding why and um, their approach to it as well, if that's okay. okay. Unless they don't want to share and that's fine too, but I wanted to open that up again. Um, I agree. And Dorothy, would you like to go ahead? Well, um, I know it's an important thing to deal with the capital expenses. And um, I enjoy uh, thinking about the finances of the council and the town. And I just thought it would be um, a good experience to do that again and to bring some fresh eyes. Um, you know, I, I got sent all the invitations to the meetings. I didn't realize, I thought that I had been appointed, to be honest, and I put it in my newsletter. So this is embarrassing um, because um, 
you know, so now I'm finding out. So yes, I definitely would like to be on JCPC. Thank you. Um, Mandy Jo. Oh, um, I like Dorothy have had an interest in finances since I joined this council. Um, unlike Dorothy, I have never been appointed to the finance committee, but I have had the pleasure of serving on JCPC for a number of years. Um, it is a unique committee in that we make recommendations and advise the manager. Um, we deal with the the year to year um, capital expenditures, and it's something that I have enjoyed doing. I've enjoyed um, contributing to the change since the form of government changed to how the committee works and how the um, reports are presented actually and, and advising the manager on what would be more helpful to the council and most helpful to the council. And I, I think I've contributed a lot to that and would love to be able to continue to contribute. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions? Michelle? Can we be reminded who was appointed to the budget coordinating group at our last meeting? Yeah, the budget coordinating group uh, at our last meeting includes myself, Andy, and Mandy Joe. I also want to just be very clear, unless we move into a fiscal situation of decline, BCG is not a heavy committee. It, I think it met twice last year. This This is a very intense, what, eight to 10 weeks of meeting on Thursday, Kathy? Yes, and I just want to say on, on budget coordinating committee, I started out on that, Michelle, and we never met, so I decided I didn't need to be on it. <laughs> it was just <laughs> one one more right. listing under my name. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we as I mentioned, we met twice this year, I, and that was, and that was a lot, so, Anika. What do you say again? I know you did who is um, who was already appointed to JCPC? Uh, Pam Rooney and Kathy Shane. And there were others that expressed interest, uh, but when it came down to the vote, that was it. Okay. Are there any other questions? All right. So when I call your name, you're either going to vote for Mandy Jo Haneke or Dorothy Pam. And um, we will start with Mandy Jo. I'm going to vote for myself. Anika Lopes. Mandy Jo. Michelle Miller. Dorothy. Dorothy Pam. Dorothy Pam. Pam Rooney. Dorothy. Kathy Shane. Mandy. Andy Steinberg. Mandy Tapp. Jennifer Todd. Dorothy. Alicia Walker. Dorothy. Shalini Balmill. Mandy Joe. Patty Angelus is absent. Anna Devlin Gothier. Mandy Joe. And Lynn Griesmer is for Mandy Joe. Uh, that is seven to five. Um, Dorothy, I want to also suggest to you that I've often attended JCPC in the audience and I have found it very useful. So don't give up your interest. Okay. Uh, so the, I'm going to move Great. to, I'm sorry. I said, thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. I mean, I, once I went on it, I was very interested. Kathy. Uh, I just want to second that because I, think thought of myself as an understudy for the first year I couldn't get on it um yeah. and and um as an understudy I went on it and then somehow I immediately became chair but in any case <laughs> it, <laughs> so I, I I I did well as an understudy <laughs> but 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 I just without it I would have had no idea what was going on it is right. is my other um point on it because there are all these tables that fly at us so and I will say that uh, JCPC has done a lot of work in the last couple of years to get a much more solid five-year plan 
and to do the inventory and so forth. And that's both a compliment to Kathy, the committee, and to Sean Mangano. Michelle? Yeah, I just feel like I want to get this off my chest, and this is not about judging how anyone voted at all. Um, but just to say that, um, you know, I often get the sense we're volunteers, essentially, and we come with different experiences. And I really would love to see us sort of share in our leadership more or work to sort of um, maybe consider someone that we might not think has the experience um, or or uplift people or or whatever. Um, it just it kind of just hurts me. Maybe I'm I'm being a little too emotional about it right now, but I just wanted to get that off my chest because I think it's it's important for us not only as a council um, but to model that for our community um, for folks who may want to engage. Um, but sort of feel like they're locked out because they might not have the relevant experience or um, so just sharing that again without judgment for for anybody's particular vote. Thanks. Um, I'm going to make a motion to appoint Councillor Mandy Johanneke to the Joint Capital Planning Committee effective immediately for a term to expire January 2nd, 2024. Is there a second? Second, Devlin Gothier. Are there any further questions? Then we've basically voted, um, unless somebody wants to. You have to vote again. You That's a different again. motion. Okay. Uh, so it's a motion. Uh, it's been made and seconded. I'll start with Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Truthfully, I don't know what we're voting for right now. Oh, we're voting for Mandy Joe to be appointed to JCPC. I thought we just voted for that. Why would we vote twice? This is actually the motion that actually must is part of the vote. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, well, I'll say yes. I made it into a motion. Thank you. Uh, Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Todd. Yes. Alicia Walker. Abstain. Uh, Shalini Bell Milne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis is absent. Uh, Anna Devlin Gothier. Yes. Lynn Greesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. So the vote is 11 in favor, uh, one no, no op opposition, one abstention, and one absent. I think that ends the votes for the thing. Um, we're going to go on to the committee and liaison reports. And uh, first, of, I want to start by thanking all of the people who chaired all of the committees and were vice chairs in this past year, um, and all the members as well, but particularly. Uh, and I, I just want to recognize those who have been chairs and are no longer chairs. Um, Michelle, thank you, and Anika as well for being chair and vice chair of GOL. And that was a year of a lot of work. And um, for you, baptism under fire because you were a new counselor. Um, for Kathy as the past chair of JCPC, I don't know who's going to be next chair, but we want to make sure we thank you. And for Town Services Committee, Dorothy. And who was vice chair? Shalini. Shalini, thank you. So Dorothy and Shalini for Town Services and Outreach Committee. Um, we may have thanked you when um, the transition took place, but if we didn't, we wanna make sure we thank you now. And Dorothy, uh, that was a really terrific thing. I know you were doing it while you were teaching many classes at the same time. And uh, it uh, certainly was a lot of work. So. I just uh, as we Anika yes. for agreeing to be chair because yes. I really right. did want to be chair. So thank right. you. So all the committees have now met. They have elected their chair and vice chair. And so as we go through the committee reports, I'm going to call on Mandy Joe and Pam Rooney as chair and vice chair. 
Thank you. Well, Lynn, CRC. CRC. Lynn did one of my announcements, which was the committee elected myself as chair and Pam Rooney as vice chair. It's the same leadership we had last year. Um, I want to thank Pam for um, going to be back backing me up this year and for backing me up last year. Um, we have a listening session coming up one week from tonight at 7 p.m. on our rental registration and um, potentially the public nuisance or nuisance house bylaw. Um, we're renaming it. Um, we're continuing to work on the permitting, the re residential rental permitting bylaws and regulations. We've begun revising the nuisance house bylaw again, renaming, renaming it public nuisance. Um, that was a referral from this council um, a while ago. And um, the proposed revisions to the zoning bylaw that are sponsored and proposed by Councillor DeAngelis and myself will have a hearing scheduled for March 2nd at 4.35 p.m. It is my understanding that the planning board hearing will be March 1st. I don't know, they normally start their meetings around 6.30, so I don't know if the hearing will be 6.35 or later. I don't know how many they have that day, um, but my I have heard that they will be March 1st and we will follow the next day on March 2nd for those revisions. Um, that's all I've got. If Pam's got anything else, she just Pam? said no. Okay, uh, Kathy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I have a question. Um, it's a process question, which is kind of unusual for me because I don't focus on them very often. But I, I don't completely understand how the duplex triplex town house didn't go through a thorough discussion at CRC before it went over to the planning board. Um, and. I don't understand how that happened. And I don't know whether it was that when we were first referring it, if we had held on to it and not referred it, because because does that mean that any one, two, or three counselors can come up, think through some zoning changes we might want, and then go and get an audience with the planning board? You know, and so I mainly discovered that the planning board, in fact, was hearing it before it had really come back to us as counselors from the committee with the committee having a discussion. So it's, and now hearing their hearings on it, I'm even more surprised because a few years ago, there was a committee process, there was a council discussion. Then we went through Paul to say, could the staff work on it? So, and it, so has something shifted? Um, and I'm not sure it's, I think it's a good shift because I wouldn't want to see lots of us go off and try to think about how we want to change some basic regulations. So it's a, it's a, why wasn't this, didn't this stay within the committee to come back to the council with the discussion before it went out to the planning board is my, if I'm not sure I stated that clearly enough. Kathy, a very good question because we also refer to CRC the whole rental thing, but that was to develop a bylaw. And uh, Mandy Joe or someone from CRC want to discuss to the referral in this case was not to develop a bylaw, but to use a take a bylaw that was proposed. Is that correct? Um. So yes, so councillors DeAngelis and I proposed something and submitted it to the president um, who put it on an agenda. Um, under our rules of procedure, um, zoning bylaws shall be initiated and introduced by submission to the council in one of the following manners, and one of them says by a councillor sponsor. Um, under the zoning law, you then, under the state law, if the council refers it, it has to go to hearing. Um, under by planning board and by the town council under state law. So we proposed our zoning amendments under the rules of procedure and under state law, the council referred it under state law for hearings as required by state law within the amount of time required by state law. Kathy? I'd just like to follow up. I, I thought, so I misunderstood when we were referring, I thought we were referring it to CRC for discussion not for a hearing. 
And let me go back to one that I know was not popular. A few counselors were talking about a moratorium that would have been a zoning law change. It didn't go directly to hearings and planning board. We, we had a whole discussion and then because it wasn't gonna get out of council, there was a petition that brought it. So I knew that was another route. So it's, it's just a, if I had known that when I was looking at it, that I wasn't referring it for discussion, I wouldn't have referred it. So I just, I, I just, mm -hmm. I had no sense that that was sending it on as opposed to here are some ideas that are being brought to us. Um, there was a garage proposal too that went to the committee. So if I were was clearer, so I think in the future, I wanna look at our rules of procedure, but I think it's not a good practice because it's taking town staff time other volunteer, the planning board time. And if it's if that's going to be all right, then I then it's doing something more than I thought we should be doing if we want to be efficient. Um, so that's my raising it. So it's not necessarily about this specific thing, but I'm thinking I could I could come up with a few I might want to do and find someone. Mm -hmm. And if the referral is literally out to hearings, that's a very different discussion than I thought just passing it to a committee. So, I, you know, when, Mandy, on the dis, the fine line distinction, some of the things that are coming to the finance committee are almost done. It's not that, it's not like we're, we're writing the language, we're being asked to consider it and talk about it and bring it back. So that's, I, I, I was just surprised that it went so quickly out rather than discussion first because I had a lot I wanted to discuss about it so I just was quiet because I thought I'll get my opportunity later and mm -hmm. and so that's what I'm bringing it up okay Mandy Jo I need to correct some things the solar moratorium bylaw proposed which was a zoning bylaw did go to hearing at the planning board NCRC immediately the moratorium building moratorium proposed by Darcy Dumont did go to hearing at the planning board and CRC immediately um, and the garage proposal proposed by councillors Ross and Ryan did go to hearing at the planning board and CRC immediately. So they all went to hearing immediately because that's what the law requires upon proposal. Um, this proposal is fully written. It's not, it, it complies with our rules and it complies with something that could be adopted immediately. It's not a proposal in words that doesn't have actual changes to bylaw proposed. It's a fully baked proposal. It's, but just to clarify, and I'm going to use the rental bylaw that CRC is working on, that will come back to the council in a draft form of some nature. And at that point, we will do an official referral. Is that correct? So it depends on what the council wants. It's going to come. So it came to the council originally by sponsors who said we were told we needed to bring it not quite ready mm -hmm. um, by our council clerk and right. town council president. Mm -hmm. And so it went to committee to come up with something. And the council, when the committee makes a recommendation in a month or so, when we finally get there, the council will have to decide whether um, it needs to go to another committee. Um, beyond say GOL for its review or whether it's ready to go directly there based on the committee's referral. That's the, the council will make that decision upon right. seeing the product that CRC produces. And that's not a zoning bylaw. That's not zoning. It's a general bylaw. And, and there are differences between zoning and general bylaws in terms of state law and how they need done. Okay. Anna. All right. So I, I think I followed that. I think one of the things that I was trying to figure out as I was listening to both Kathy and Mandy Joe was I was looking at the flow chart for zoning bylaws um, that is on the CRC website. And that was helpful until you just reminded me that the, what we were talking about wasn't a zoning bylaw. It's a rental bylaw. permitting is not zoning. Correct. Okay. Yeah. That, okay. Now my head's on straight. straight. So um, anyway, that flowchart's great. Um, my question is, could you remind me, you said 7 p.m. on Monday. Is that what you said? When When is the listening session? 7 p.m. On Monday. 
Great. one week from today. It would be really phenomenal. Um, and I don't think this is to the sponsors. I think this is to Paul. Engage Amherst is such a great resource and has a page dedicated to this, but it's very out of date. Um, and it, if it's being updated, thank you. Cause I, I was just going to say short of digging through old packets, which I don't know that people would know to do. Um, it'd be great to have that get updated so that we can, uh, send folks to the listening sessions. Thank you. And I, we failed to point out that listening session on the agenda of future meetings, um, which is an oversight on our part. I apologize for that. So there is a listening session that CRC is having on Monday, the 13th at seven o'clock. And the listening session will focus on residential rental permitting and potentially the nuisance house bylaw, but mainly residential rental permitting. Okay, thank you. Jennifer. Um, yes, so I'm not, um, I just wanna kind of make a statement. I'm not looking for mm -hmm. a sort of discussion or an answer. Yeah, but um, I, I have some of Kathy's share, some of Kathy's concerns that- Please speak to the mic. You can't hear? I, I have some, share some of Kathy's concerns that, the proposed zoning revisions are so sweeping with just major you know, repercussions, consequences, impacts on the town. Mm -hmm. And I came across today, just looking through some files, um, a proposal, or maybe it was a motion that Councillor Rooney um, proposed. It might've been the first or second council meeting we had last year. And it was asking for creation of a task force or working group on retention of housing for workforce and families. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, because I think Councilor Rooney brought it up forward several times, it never, it, it was, it, it was not put together. It was, yeah. they, right, squash, thank you, might be the, might be the word. Mm -hmm. And I think that that would have been a forum for really thinking through strategies and zoning changes, or if that's what was entailed, to increase housing for moderate and middle income and workforce households. And I feel like because that didn't happen, there was a void. And so these sweeping zoning, you know, proposed zoning revisions that are, can be brought forth by one or two counselors mm -hmm. are just now out there. And it's like they're, the gates have been open. And it, as far as process, that really, it doesn't feel right. I'm, I'm hearing that. And I, yeah, um, Andy. Yeah, I'm somewhere of the same feeling that we have gotten into a point where one or two interested people on the council for good reason, and I'm, I don't doubt their motives, are putting forth very complex proposed bylaws, whether they be zoning or general, and they're getting a lot of, taking a lot of time, committee time, community time, staff time, and um, I think that we need to step back and think about our procedure and whether we need to recognize that when one or two counselors make a proposal, that we really need to take the time to have some discussion um, and uh, before we decide to move forward and use that amount of time because these things are, are, are eating up our committees. On the other hand, I have another problem and I flip it around. And so I don't know how to handle this because the purpose of committees is to try and help work through these issues and to try and decide what is um, really important and what are the key issues, what are the ramification of the issues to inform the vote so that doesn't have to take the time of having 13 people discuss it. And so we really um, get into a quandary as to uh, which way that it's going to go. And with zoning, it's, it's a particular problem that is gonna be harder to solve if we make the conclusion that it has to go to a hearing as the next step, because the hearing then involves the planning board mm -hmm. and it gives it to the community a much wider sense that this is what the council wants to do 
than is warranted by the fact that the council never really under understood it, considered it, or talked about it. So I, I really urge us to find a way, and it may be through GOL and the Rules Committee process, mm -hmm. to think this through and take this um, up as a major rules consideration and bring um, a thoughtful um, analysis back to the full council. And and the timing of that is appropriate since GOL is in fact looking at the rules. Anna? Yeah, I, I hear what Andy is saying and I also am feeling a bit of what um, Jennifer expressed around, you know, or I think it was Jennifer who said, you know, it's it's at a hearing at planning board and we haven't talked about it in months or looked at it in months and haven't seen the most recent draft unless we're on CRC or are stocking their packets. And, you know, if that's an expectation, then that's an expectation, but I will speak for myself that I'm not reading every committee packet for committees that I'm not on. Um, and, you know, if, if that's not good, then tell me. Uh, but, but I think that, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about, and, and this can be a thing for GOL to deal with, is when we refer something to a committee, we're saying, this is what we're choosing to spend our time on. And I think what's challenging to me is when folks, and I'm sure I'm guilty of this as well, have not brought up concerns because they say, oh, it's going to go to committee, it'll get sorted out, I'll deal with it when it comes back. But then by the time it's gone through committee, it's gotten polished, it's gotten, you know, really combed through with a fine tooth comb. And then, you know, someone has a huge issue that could have been solved easily at the get-go, but now is a lot harder to navigate. So I think that this is, and again, if this goes to GOL to discuss, great, but I'd like us to really think about when we're referring something to a committee, what that means, and that that is our opportunity to either raise in the meeting or email the the chairs of the committees what questions or concerns that we have with the, with the measure. Um, I'm not saying that would have fixed this particular problem, but I wanted to address what, what Andy, I think, was talking about too. Like, can, can I just clarify, my concern on is it went to committee and the committee didn't work on it. So I sent Great. questions, you know, so I'm I'm saying I thought that that was the process that we would go and have yeah. that discussion in a smaller group. Okay. So, so yes, I think this is GOL. So, uh, uh, so I'm going to actually, we did not post this as an agenda item, and it's now looking more and more like an agenda item. This is a serious question, and it does need to be addressed by GOL. And I think we need to leave it at that. You have all been invited to submit uh, suggested revisions to our rules of procedure uh, by close of business on Friday. And uh, later on during the president's report, I was gonna remind people of that. And um, this is one of those items that should be referred even if you can't come up with the exact language, at least articulate the issues of what it is you want to make sure GOL addresses. Okay. Uh, further comments, Pam. I was. It's a continuation of this topic. Just saying that oftentimes we get something for referral, and there's very little time to actually understand it or have studied it to think if we even want to support it generally. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this. I would say we probably would want to support it generally, but have no clue what the depth right. uh, and right. ramification is, whether it's either cost the town mm -hmm. or time and energy from staff. Right. Agree. Jennifer, you have your hand up. Um, yes, I have a question, then can I continue a comment on... I mean, I, yeah, I, I just want to, again, we did not post this as an agenda item. And so I'd really like to funnel the recommendations or issues to GOL who's looking at the rules. So with these zoning, proposed zoning revisions, so now the sponsors are going to meet with you know, the Affordable Housing Trust and the Zoning Board of Appeals. So can you know, other counselors <laughs> meet with, the, you know, if we have a different, you know, to share maybe both, you know, concerns. It, it just seems like it's just out of the gate. Um, um, Athena, we've had other counselors attend 
ZBA meetings, planning board meetings, et cetera, and have commented. Let's talk about the dangers of that. So our rules allow any counselor to attend any other mm -hmm. meeting of a public body and make public comment during the public comment period. Right. As sponsors, the ZBA has specifically invited us to speak to them. And the AMAHT has specifically invited us. We did not invite ourselves. We were invited. We were okay. invited to the planning board. But you as a counselor, have every right to attend those meetings and speak in public comment. One other uh, housekeeping question. Can you please move to the Sorry. mic? For one other housekeeping question. Um, for the hearing next Monday, will we get the link somewhat soon so we can, you know, put it out to our districts? Or so you mean the, so the listening I, session? For the yeah. listening session, yeah. I had requested today, I had sent the agenda to Athena, but I have requested that she hold off on posting that till Wednesday because my vice chair had some concerns about the proposed agenda itself. And so it will be produced on Wednesday. Okay, thank you. Okay, Shalini. Clarifying, but um, it's, isn't, I mean, isn't it a thing to have public input before we, I mean, yeah, we could have a discussion and then have public input, but I don't see what's the harm. I'm just clarifying what are the concerns people have that we're going to listen to people. And I think it's important maybe to clarify to the public, this is not the final, like set in stone. This is a starting conversation proposed by some counselors and we want people's input. And I think it's a good thing to get that early on. And it's going to be a reiterative process where we'll have multiple places where we're engaging with the public, right? The, the problem is that on certain zoning, on zoning bylaws, there's a very prescribed state calendar by which it has to be heard and then it has to be brought back to the council and then we have to go through a first and second reading. And I think what people are, I'm hearing tonight, and I totally, totally understand, is that we'd like to see, figure out if there could be a step before referral for hearing. Okay. And that's something GOL is going to have to wrestle with. We may have to consult legal counsel as well. Okay. One more. Can we, uh, what? Um, Pam, you were suggesting that the task force would do, can this, I mean, I'm imagining that the CRC is going to be that group. And so whatever recommendations you, I mean, now that we don't have that group, it, can we take your ideas of what you were proposing in terms of how we can think about it and study the pros and cons and whatnot? The problem that we ran into, I spent a lot of time with Pam on the task force, was to what extent was it a task force and was it essentially a committee that would be a committee of CRC based on the comprehensive housing policy? And it never could, we never could come clear. I'm certainly more than glad to engage in the conversation again, but we're not gonna do that tonight, okay? Again, it's not on the agenda. Okay. I'm <laughs> trying to stick to the rules, gang. Um, are there any other questions or comments? I, we were actually looking for committee updates. Um, elementary school building, Kathy and Alicia, anything else from besides what we did today? Uh, just, we did have two forums last week. Um, and uh, so far the school gets rave reviews. We've got great questions that we're going to be developing questions and answers. Alicia can speak to this too, but we're starting to say, how can we have some outreach and set up meetings? The next big step for the committee itself is not this Friday, but the 17th, when the full report that needs to go to the MSBA will be pulled together and we vote on it. Um, we've got most seen most of the pieces. But that's the step that then triggers the marching on to the MSBA meeting at the end of April. 
So after we meet on the 17th, we're more in the mode, what would you call, call it all hands on deck to go out and talk about the school, provide information, go out and talk to groups. So we're starting to set up those meetings. Okay. Alicia, anything else? Um, no, I think Kathy did a great job just to reemphasize that right now we're working on um, community engagement, getting people educated on what's happening and getting people excited about the project. And so I think that's a big focus as to where we are right now. Okay, thank you. Um, Finance Committee, Andy and Kathy are chair and vice chair, Andy. Okay, I'll start and then see if Kathy has anything that she wants to add. Uh, uh, you do have a written report that uh, is very brief, but uh, was intended to uh, let you know where we are, what we did at our last meeting. And uh, we asked, and is, which has been a common procedure actually, to have the quarter reports for first and second quarter of the current year that we're in uh, presented. And what that's about is that um, council adopts a budget and it makes it based upon presumptions of revenue and decisions about expenses. And uh, it's um, our opportunity to hear from staff about how revenue and expenses have performed during each of the calendar quarters to match. Um, usually the finance committee gets those in advance and can ask questions that we've had time to look at, because I think you, if you've looked at it, you've seen the complexity of even the written comments. It was just um, a glitch this time that that didn't happen. So we're gonna put it back on the second agenda. So if um, anybody has any questions, they're welcome to forward them to us and uh, you know we can pose them or, um, you're welcome to attend the committee meeting when it's posted. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be starting the discussion. Uh, it, the way that it was written about uh, discuss and recommend action on debt exclusion, there's no recommendation that's going to be made. Um, that was actually uh, language that was just adopted from the uh, calendar that we received last week when we had the presentation of what the process would be. Um, we have stuck with those dates, but uh, the uh, actual vote on language and uh, vote on exclusion, exclusion language and date uh, is before the council on the 27th and uh, uh, February and the February 21st committee meeting is a uh, um, more likely date uh, to actually um, have further discussion about that. But um, we're gonna begin the discussion tomorrow. The other thing we're talking about is uh, the uh, Centennial Water Facility, which was referred today. And the other thing, while we um, have our staff there who have expertise, we're gonna get back to the water sewer regulations for the reasons explained in the committee report. So I won't repeat what that is. And uh, it, we are working out a calendar which we'll be able to share with everybody that goes through the entire um, first half of the calendar year explaining what our meeting dates and plans are. And hopefully we'll be able to get that out to everybody um, very soon. But I wanted to let you know where we were. So um, I don't think I have anything else, Kathy. Do you have anything to add? Okay. Um, GOL, uh, the new chair and vice chair are Pat and Jennifer. Jennifer, Pat's not here. Is there anything you'd like to talk about, GOL? Um, let's say I don't have much to report from the last meeting, but it sounds like we have we will have a new task before us. So I'm looking forward to that. We have a big <laughs> task before us. Um, okay, uh, JCPC, as we mentioned, is meeting this Thursday for the first time. Uh, Anika, anything on Jones Library? 
Uh, yes, so there was a presentation from Sephora Associates, which is a design firm that has worked with the architects for over 25 years um, that revolved around um, feel and color. Um, there was a presentation on multi all multi stall all user stall bathrooms, and also reconfigured floor plan for the second floor. Um, the next meeting will be uh, Thursday the 9th at four thirty p.m. Okay. Um, TSO uh, chair and vice chair are Anika and Anna. Anything to report from TSO? Um, thank the uh, committee for um, putting me in as chair and and Anna in as vice chair. Thank you for that. Um, we had a very brief meeting where we, of course, held the election. We adopted the new meeting schedule, and um, we had a review on um, some upcoming agenda items. And we had a quick uh, revisit on a um, community walk brought forward by. Um, your district four representatives, and we explored a dark patch of sidewalk on East Pleasant Street with then Paul Bachman and Lynn, you joined us, and um, those residents there are so pleased and happy that that has been resolved. So uh, thank you to Paul Bachman for that. Um, and then next meeting will be on Thursday, February 9th at 7 p.m. And Jennifer was with us on that dark. Yes, walk. Jennifer. Thank you. Jennifer was with us was on that dark, cold night. Yeah, Jennifer is always with us. <laughs> Thank right. you. Uh, so liaison reports. Uh, you all have new assignments, or some people are new assignments. Are there any liaison reports? Uh, yes. Dorothy. Um, this is for uh, CSSJC. Uh, Earl Miller was a guest at the last meeting and they were talking about community uh, conversations. Um, and um, as a part of the discussion, the black community uh, would like to have a bigger role in making uh, decisions um, and um, would like also a better way to reach the community, hoping to have their own email or uh, at least an Engage Amherst page so that people could contact them. But their major concern was talking about the Youth Empowerment Center as a safe space and center, uh, and that it's beyond recreation. It would include mentoring, uh, job readiness, classes, entrepreneurship. And they're kind of hoping that some ARPA money might be available. Um, and uh, Jennifer Moyston, who was at the meeting, was uh, bringing up a thought that she would like the center to be a little bit regionalized, thinking of the, the youth of Sunderland, who might be... Uh, needing some uh, uh, kind of like a more black friendly space. And we ended up talking about upward the Upward Bound program, which used to operate out of UMass and which people had spoke highly of. And uh, you know, I was a counselor in Upward Bound uh, 100 years ago myself, totally believe in the program and um, would like very much to see if we can't get that going again. Um, just feeling that the needs of the youth are strong and we need to get organized on them. So that's basically the report. Okay. Are there any other liaison reports? Seeing no hands, we're going to go to the town manager's report. Paul, are there things you'd like to highlight? Sure. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so we had a you, everybody experienced the freeze on Friday night and Saturday. Um, I really credit our staff, the um, Cress and uh, Craig's doors work together to ensure that every person who was on the streets had the opportunity and actually was housed um, in someplace safe and warm uh, for the weekend, if not longer. And uh, we also had uh, the fire department and police department on high alert if they found somebody out. This is, it was really dangerous weather conditions on Friday night. So credit to them for that. Um, in the town manager report, you see some of the uh, images that we have been promoting called Why, Why Amherst with our fire department to try to um, differentiate working for the town of Amherst versus um, another any other community. There are a lot of people out, um, a lot of communities all recruiting at the same time. And this is a initiative by our communications director and fire chief to sort of like, let's put a, uh, a face to the department to try and help people say, hey, I could be part of that department as well. And it, you know, I just want to share those with, with the council. 
Um, audit came in very clean, um, no management letter, which is really a super um, way for uh, our comptroller, Sonia Aldridge, to go out. So very proud of the work that she's done for that. Um, health insurance rate increases came in. That's just something we were waiting for at the MMA conference. 7.94%. We had projected 8%. So no big savings there, unfortunately. Um, but it's at least it's a piece of the puzzle in terms of where we are going uh, financially. And I forgot to mention that Amy Rusecki also received an award from the American Water or uh, mm -hmm. Massachusetts Water Works Association. I meant to say it when she was in the room. Uh, that's a really um, big accomplishment. That's something that one person gets every year, and it's not every year that they award it. And uh, she's shown her leadership statewide on this. Is has a real um, looked looked at as a as a water expert um, by other places in in the state. Um, and then I credit the um, Crest Department and DEI Department who organized a grief circle today. Um, and it was, many counselors were there. So thank you for putting for being there and many members of the Community Safety Social Justice Committee and members of the public. Um, and it was a very powerful time. And uh, on, on my way out, the, the Crest Director said it's something he wanted to sort of continue that this was um, uh, it's a it's a conversation that needs to be had by the town, and this was a, a, a really nice starting point. A lot of people didn't know about it. We didn't do a, a very good job publish uh, publicizing it, so you may not have really noticed it, but we will be doing better uh, looking forward. I think there were about 25 people there, I'm guessing. There was people in and out, yeah. um, but it was, just, it, was, it was an important time for people just to sit and listen and share their stories, so um, credit to Earl basically and Pamela for thinking this up and, and thinking this is the right way to think to for the town to start to grapple with um, this tragedy. Uh, Dorothy. Um, well, I wanted to second your comments about the grief circle. I think we had some really great conversations today. Um, but I just wanted to you mentioned the leisure or the recreation department production of Little Mermaid. I just want to say that it was an absolutely stupendous production. It was outrageously fabulous with costumes like you can't believe, wonderful performances, and more people flying through the air than I've seen on Broadway. I mean, it was, you know, I had some family members with me who were kind of reluctantly came and they were just blown away. It was, it was wonderful. And I love the seriousness of the masking. You walk in, you're greeted by friendly volunteers who handed you your masks. The whole audience was masked. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank them all, all the people that were involved for the wonderful job they did. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions or comments from the council? Okay. Seeing none, we're going to go on to we did minutes. We're going on to the town council comments. Uh, the first thing is the addendum to my president's report. That is in the uh, uh, packet, uh, and it is sp specifically addresses the December eighth meeting. Uh, with Senator Comerford and Representative Dom and the brief discussion of PFAS and turf. And Michelle, uh, you have your hand up. Thank you, Lynn, and thanks for, for doing that. I really, I really do appreciate it. Um, just sort of along the lines of um, the president reports going forward, I wanted to uh, make two suggestions or something for us to think about. Um, I think it would be really helpful for counselors to see the notes uh, that you create during those meetings as best as possible. Um, so that if something doesn't make it into a president's report because of timing, maybe to have it sort of stand alone um, so that we can see notes from those really important meetings. The other thing um, I was thinking about is I counselors have expressed interest in, in, in attending meetings with our legislative delegation. And so similar to what we do for agenda setting, um, I'm wondering if we could, uh, counselors could sign up to attend those monthly meetings. Um, maybe if there's a particular matter that a counselor is working on and the timing would make sense 
um, like for example, well, Anna would be there anyway, but like with the special legislation, for example, that was proposed tonight, um, so that more of us can have an opportunity to be in, involved in those discussions and, and just to make those connections with our delegation. So thank you for con considering those okay. things. Uh, thank you. Are there any other comments? Are we just on president report right now? Yes. Oh. Alicia? Um, thank you. I just want to take a second to vocalize my support for what Michelle just said. I think that that would be a great idea if that is possible. Okay. Are there any other comments? Alicia? Yes, sorry. I'm actually just wondering, um, is there a reason why these are making it just to us now? Why what is just making uh, sorry the the update from the December eighth meeting? Uh, it was only requested earlier last week. But are those things not just regularly included? I I do a president's report, okay, and then I ask if there's questions. And in the case of the president's report from December, there have been two things. That where I have been asked to do more elaboration on them. The first I did back in January, and this one I did just now because it was just requested now. And it was- But they don't get included without, under, uh, without a request just because they happened? I, I, sometimes on the president's report, I include things or maybe I miss something or whatever. I mean, it's- it's not a small task to do them. It means I go through my entire calendar. Uh, I try to include everything I can. Uh, in this case, um, I'm more than glad to speak more to this particular issue, but I, unless there's questions, uh, yes, I include them in the president's report. And if it's not clear enough, or that you feel I've missed something, then people have asked for a further clarification. And then I provide that. And that's why this one is still back on December. Yeah, I think that's helpful. Um, and I think maybe I would appreciate some more elaboration just because it's, I'm, so I, I do appreciate and understand that the president of the council is a, an enormous responsibility um, and that you take on so much. Um, but as a counselor, in order to stay up to date as to what is happening behind the scenes of like, this is all council work, right? Like it's not just personal work. So I think it's really important for me to understand what things are being considered when they're being presented to us. Like, is there certain things that you think of in your head when you're making the president's report? Like, are there certain details that you include for a certain, like, what is your method methodology behind what you compile and bring to us. Mm -hmm. um, and the really specific reason why I'm asking is because like, I just assume that everything's being handed to me is everything that there is. Um, and so for me personally, it's not often that I would ask for something more to be included because I would not know that there is more to be included if it was not just mm -hmm. available for me to see in the first place. Um, and so when there's things or information that's happening, that's really pertaining to specific things, council matters or things that we're working on on the council, I would just wonder why that wouldn't just be included initially. And so I think it would be helpful for me to just know like how you, how you compile these reports. I'll be more than glad to describe that. Awesome. And you don't out... have to go into crazy depth, just <laughs> briefly. I'm sorry? I don't need like super in depth, just like a brief explanation. I mean, helpful. I start by going through my calendar and uh, recording when I meet, have different meetings with different people, like when I meet with the town manager, when I meet with um, the bid or the chamber. My practice in general has been with the bid and chamber meetings and with Senator Comerford and, Dom, and Representative Dom is to then also provide a little more detail since those are meetings that are, you know, they're not like, for instance, we all showed up to do a, a 
proclamation reading. I mean, that a proclamation reading didn't require any more detail. So I provide that detail. And then on occasion, it's happened twice so far, uh, that uh, people have asked for more detail. And um, that's what I, that's how I do it. And I will also say that we only started doing president's reports um, what, about three, two, three, two and a half, three years ago. I think so. It was, it's not required any place that we do it. Um, the, um, and I'm more than glad to talk about my own process anytime, but I don't want to bore people with, you know, how do I go through my calendar? Thank you, Lynn. I think it's just, it's very helpful, um, the president's report in general. So I'm glad that that's something that we do, even if it's not required. And I hope that we continue to do that. Um, and I do think, like Michelle said, that it would also be helpful to have notes. So that way, you know, it, if you're missing things or if you don't have enough time or whatever be the issue that we have like a brief idea mm -hmm. and that it's not putting any extra work on you to include those things. If there's just like jots of notes that could also be very helpful. Right. Thank you. Yes. Shalini? I think this is more a clarification maybe for the public. Um, but in my mind, the when I, okay, in my mind, when we had these discussions, um, there were, there was a lot of discussion about the state, uh, the the task force about Joe Comerford's bill, about David Rakow, who is one of the experts at the state task force, and so. Typically, I would expect that Lynn would cover the conversations in more detail about PFAS. I'm just talking about like this, what was not covered, the PFAS and what was discussed with Joe Comerford. However, in this case, I can see why you might, Lynn might not cover that in much detail because we were already having those conversations about and it was me specifically who brought up what is the proposed bill? What does it include? What does it not include? What is the state task force? Um, David Rakow being an expert there, what has he said and what is the task force included? So, I mean, I just wanna clarify for the public that it wasn't like we did not know. So it's not like your omission to include more details kept us in the dark. Can I, I'm, I'm actually gonna go ahead and make a much further detailed statement, okay? Learning that Senator Comerford planned to refile a bill relating to PFAS was not surprising to me. In fact, what might have surprised me was if she is dropping her interest in the idea and was not going to refile her bill. The council already was aware of her involvement in the issue. In fact, just a few days earlier, her bill filed in the 2021-22 session was referred to in a draft resolution discussed by the council on December 5th. Whether artificial turf would even be affected by proposed legislation was not at all clear. In an email on December 6th, Senator Comerford suggested that we add PFAS to the agenda for the meeting on December 8th. By that time, the council had already voted unanimously on December 5th to adopt the amended motion to transfer funds for the athletic fields to the school committee, leaving it up to them to decide which option, two or three, to pursue. Some counselors were still working on an amended resolution at that point because we did not vote on the resolution on the, on the 5th. And that resolution that we adopted said, the it was a resolution about the safety of the athletic complex and the need to investigate the impacts of PFAS in all consumer products. This resolution was adopted on December 12th, just a few days later. So what puzzles me is why 
if the resolution sponsors dropped reference to Senator Comerford's bill for the 2021-22 session, the spot prospect of a refiled bill would be important. Since it was removed from the revised resolution, it did not seem to me then or now that Senator Comerford's ongoing interest in PFAS was notable. As we wrapped up our work on the resolution, we had already voted either option two or three. I wanna also say in doing a lot of research this weekend about how many bills are filed in the legislature, how many of them relate to PFAS, how many relate to artificial turf, how many Senator Comerford has sponsored or co-sponsored, how, how many Representative Dom has sponsored or co-sponsored. What I also learned is that Senator Comerford actually is a co-sponsor of an omnibus bill on PFAS. And it's that omnibus bill that is now encompassing many of the individual bills, 26 in, in number from last year that mentioned PFAS. So the ongoing debate PFAS in the House and the Senate has increased. In fact, it's a great case study of how you take one issue and it slowly starts rising in importance to the point that there's a study commission. And now there is an omnibus bill building on that study commission. That's all I have to say. Andy. First of all, if uh, Michelle or Dorothy have anything to pursue on the PFAS issue, I would suggest letting them go okay. before and then coming back to me. Michelle? Yeah, um, I wasn't planning to rehash this. I've already spoken with you about it, Lynn, um, but I do feel because Shalini just brought this up and you made a statement. I would like to clarify that the discrepancy here is in the public records request that was made by a community member, what came to light were some internal notes that you had taken during your meeting. And in those notes, you say, Joe has filed a bill to ban all PFAS products. Bill would make alternatives necessary. And so from some people's perspectives, your understanding that the bill moved from only affecting consumer products to affect, which is what Shalini and Mandy and I were really talking about when we were working on the resolution, I think, um, to being broad enough to encompass all PFAS products and your acknowledgement that an alternative for the field may be necessary that was really important information that didn't make it into the president's report. And while the vote had already been taken on the appropriation, I think at the time of the discussion on the resolution, it would have been really good for us to talk about that, to say, hey, there's this other bill out there and it may affect all PFAS products and we may have to go to an alternative. Um, but Sometimes I think it's easy for us to think that we all know everything, but we don't. If we're not, you know, if we've got our our lives and our kids and our work and everything else, we don't always know, you know every piece of the puzzle. And so um, I don't think it's something that we have to be like uh, reprimanding each other about, or even just, just to, just to talk about like, Hey, this piece was missed in the president's report. And it could have been helpful for us to have that discussion. And it is from the public's or from some of the public's point of view, um, particularly the notes that you do acknowledge that an alternative may be necessary and that it would ban all P fast I think that is relevant uh, information, and I can see why the public would feel, um, you know, concerned about not having have had that information. So thank you. Dorothy. I'm not going to talk about the president's report because that's not what upsets me. The discussion that we had, I mean, you know, we can make this into you have to know this, you have to know that. We were basically talking about should we have PFAS and in artificial turf 
in fields for young people to play on. And those of us who spoke against it, who talked about the growing number of scientists who have given evidence that this was a very dangerous thing to do, particularly for adolescents, in terms of disrupting hormonal cycles and whatever, in terms of sports people talking about injuries, we were made to feel that we were foolish and that somehow we were standing in the way of young people having a successful sports activity. And there was body language from, from people uh, in the audience, which was I would consider to be rather aggressive. And, you know, it's... The issue isn't what you wrote in your notes. The issue is when Shalini made a statement that it was limited and it wasn't going to be whatever, she wasn't, you, you, you correct other people. You correct other people and say, no, that's not correct. Even in cases where when Jennifer was correct about saying more people were against something than were for it on a different issue, but you didn't correct Shalini with information that you knew. And I have had great trust in you. And that's what I'm upset about is that I feel that the trust that I've had in you would have said that you would have said, well, we should understand this may be a big issue statewide. And that didn't happen. So that's what I'm upset about. It, it's, it's it's not what the president's report, it's what happened in the meeting that I'm upset about. So thank you. I guess Shalini. Can we just clarify again, because Joe Comerford in the in the newspaper was cited as saying that uh, syn while synthetic turf may come under a state ban if legislation is passed and signed, it's not currently addressed in proposed legislation. So my understanding is that even though it may happen in the future, right now the legislation that she's proposing or is on the table does not include and that's what I've heard from David Rakow and the state um, task force, which is what is informing um, a lot of these legislations. So to me, it still feels it's not, that the athletic turf field is not included in the current legislation. Andy. Yeah, the reason that I had asked to wait is because I was really not wanting to focus solely on PFAS as a single issue. Um, and it really may not be about PFAS at all. So I just want to make that clear that I'm not really dealing with that. But it's really, a, a, it's a different item and it's a matter of uh, something that I want to entrust to the president, to the town manager, and to others who we've put into um, unique leadership positions. When conversations take place with legislators, and I know this because I had a lot of conversations with legislators, particularly in my days when I was uh, director of the Western Massachusetts Legal Aid Program, and we were talking about policy things, there were things that I knew that they were sharing with me that they did not one public that they were just venturing what their thought process might be. And there are other times when they were really stating policy. And it was very important in order to have appropriate trust. Um, and this does not just legislators because it was people in administrative positions in, in state and federal government too, that it was important to be clear about what the intent was as to whether it would be made, it was to be made public or whether it was an attempt because I was in a leadership position in a uh, national organization on legal aid to make sure that I understood what was going on. And um, I think that it, it's vital that we trust our leaders to have some discretion to recognize when there is information being shared with them, that there's an expectation that um, it is to help them to understand, but it is not something that the person who's imparting the information wishes to be made public. And um, so I don't want us to set up expectations um, of anyone um, in this room who's in a leadership position that um, if they um, are, if they make that conclusion that it was not intended to be public and it would not be good for their relationships with that individual, 
to make it public that they shouldn't be able to do so. Michelle? Okay, now I'm really confused. <laughs> Um, I, I, I don't think that I, I appreciate what Andy was saying. Um, however, I'm just not sure how it's relevant unless what you're saying, Andy, is that this particular information was not meant to be made public or I, I think that Joe was pretty clear that she wanted this information to be known, um, so maybe that's not what you meant, but I guess that, that yeah, let me clarify because I me. thought I said yeah. it was clear at the beginning. The reason I wanted to wait is because it really was not intended to be a comment about PFAS in particular, mm -hmm. that I had no basis for making a conclusion about PFAS. It's just a general observation that we need to trust our leaders to make appropriate decisions and um, about what is public and what is not, but it was not intended in any way to be related to the PFAS subject. Okay. Um, maybe this is for another discussion, but I do just want to say in response to that, that the leaders of our council is there to conduct the business of the council, not to have proprietary information that other counselors would not have access to. At least that's not my understanding. So when you say to trust the leaders that if they have information that's not ready to be public yet, um, that's not how I see what the role of the council president is. And if that is the role of the council president, I would like to understand that more because it was my understanding that the role of the council president was to conduct the business of the council, not to have proprietary information that other counselors would not have access to. And so maybe that's a separate discussion, but that's very deeply concerning to me to hear that. And maybe because I don't understand it all right now, and I'm willing to hear um, more, maybe it's a different agenda item at a different time. Um, but I did want to just say uh, to Shalini, because I do think we were grappling with the bill and, and, and when we were working on the resolution, and I wanted to say that as far as I understand it, Joe's bill would ban any artificial turf uh, products that are sold or manufactured in the U.S., so unless we found a, a, an artificial turf that was PFAS free, um, which we've tried to find, some people have said they have found, um, we that ban would prohibit those products. So it's possible that we could install something that then would become um, illegal in the state of Massachusetts. And I don't know what, but I know that the, the exceptions in the, in the bill are very, very limited. Can I, again, the question that came before the council was whether we were going to give the regional high school money to do a track and a field. And it became a debate about PFAS instead of the question before the council. And as much as I have wanted, I have resisted being very clear about my own position on PFAS, which would probably shock all of you. Because it isn't what the debate before the council is. The debate before the council was whether we're going to give money for a track and field. That was the debate. And when we came up with the amendment to say option two or three, it was to open that up and get out of saying it had to be this or it had to be that. I, one of the things that is troubling to me is how many times the council goes off of an issue that's not before the council. 
And that's where we use time that many people then complain about. So um, I'm not going to make a public statement about how I really feel about PFAS because that's not the council's business at this point. Alicia. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Thank you, Lynn. So initially, I was going to say a bunch of the things that Michelle already said, but really quickly, I also want to respond to that because I do understand what you're saying, Lynn, but I, I respectfully, very strongly disagree because it's not that cut and dry and nothing we do here, no decisions we make here on the council are that cut and dry. We are approving money, yes, but for a project that we essentially have to agree with the project if we're going to appropriate money for such cause. And this is, this is and has been a significant portion of the project and what some people disagree with as a part of the whole project. It is a part, it is a piece of a whole. And so I think it does not make sense for us to look at it without that one piece to the whole because it makes up the whole entire picture of the puzzle that we are all looking at together to see what works best for the people in our community. It's not just we're giving money or we're not giving money because it's the project that we're giving money to. And I think that that was why the motion was changed essentially so that we could have, there was less of a burden on the council as to which decision was being made. But the original decision was, do we want to give money, appropriate money to put in, to install the turf? That was the original decision. And so PFAS then became a huge part of that conversation, rightfully so. I don't think it's like that cut and dry that they're that separate. I think everything is really interconnected. And I think that's what makes this so very difficult. Um, and that was not originally what I was gonna say. I just wanted to speak a little bit more about what Michelle said. And I just wanted to add my plug because she did say a lot of what I was already going to say, but speaking for myself personally, like my experiences on this council in the last year, there has been a lot of times where I have felt excluded from information or the knowledge necessary to know important policies or processes or make important decisions. And I felt excluded like me personally, that other counselors had the information that I did not have. And that is an issue because we are one body working to make decisions together. Um, and so again, I just feel very strongly about the way that this is happening. This, this in my opinion, was very important information for us to be, be able to have access to speaking for me personally, because I know it was said that we did have access to this information. I, this is my first time working in politics. I am learning so much. This completely was over my head. I missed it. I heard the mentions of the bill. I did not know the specifics. I did not know the details. It was taken out. I had no reason to look into it any further. I had no reason to understand the ramifications. There was none of that for me personally. So for anyone who is going to sit up here and say the counselors knew, you can exclude me from that statement. I did not know, and it would have been helpful for me to know this. And for me, this would have constituted new information. Okay, fair enough. Shalini? Since we're continuing to discuss on PFAS, I find it, and that's one of my proposals in the rules of procedure, is that I feel that sometimes when we do share research because I was one of the people who did a lot of research on this, connecting with people in the task force. And I presented it to the council that this is what the bill says. And talking about the bill, again, in the newspaper, Joe Comerford says the PFAS legislation has no position on turf as a concept. And she says that it may come, but it's not currently addressed. So I think there's still a lot of confusion right now, whether it is not, but my understanding is still the same. So anyway, coming back to the part where I talked about the Joe Comerford's bill, I talked about the task force, I talked about uh, David Reckow. So I don't know what else I can do. Should I send share this information in writing maybe? so that everyone feels like they heard, because sometimes I feel I'm not heard. Like I shared a lot and I spend a lot of time doing that research, but it's not, clearly it wasn't heard by everyone. So that's something maybe we can discuss in the rules of procedure, how to make sure that one is that the information is shared and second, when it is shared, that it is heard by everyone. 
Jennifer? Um, yeah, so I wasn't gonna, I didn't think we need another person to wade in. And I, I don't think actually that it would have, if, the, if what was in Lynn's notes was shared, I actually don't think it would have, well, we had already voted and I don't think it would have changed a vote because we, but just to clarify, because I think it was a, a December 12th, you and I had a little exchange and you were clarifying for me that in uh, Senator Comerford's bill, it only spoke to PFAS and consumer products. So I think then the question became, if four days before that, when the president and vice president were meeting with our state representatives and Senator Comerford said, actually I'm filing a bill that will, this is, as I understand it, will include PFAS in all commercial products, which would include turf, would that have been a logical time to have corrected you? Because what you were saying is what you knew, but our president and vice president had new information from the meeting on December 8th. Would that have been the logical time the to only, say that? The, Not that it would have changed anything we'd already voted. The only information we had that was new, and I frankly think I, I'm not even clear why I wrote what I wrote in those notes was that she was going to refile her bill and that it dealt with commercial products. That's it. That's all we had. And it turns out she ends up not refiling the bill because she signed on to the omnibus bill, which came out of the task force. I only learned that this weekend. That's, I just wanted to clarify what yeah. the okay. exchange was. Can, I Let me just go on and just suggest um, I have now invited, because the council has asked for this, I have invited Senator Comerford and Representative Dom to attend a council meeting. They have accepted. It is will be on March 6th. The portion of the meeting that they will be here for will begin at 645. I will be asking counselors in advance if there are specific issues you would like them to address. Meantime, I have suggested that they think about the bills that, that they have either filed or they are aware of that would be of most interest to the town and to the council. Okay, so March 6th, 645. That is, we would have done it earlier, but that is the earliest that the senator is available. Um, I'd also like to remind people that as I did earlier about the GOL process. And I think we came up with a lot more uh, discussion tonight that was relevant to that. Uh, and uh, then we're going to go on to future agenda items. And I'm going to call on Michelle who has uh, placed a description of a retreat that she would like to propose. And I would like to hear from other counselors as to other issues they would like addressed during a retreat. So, Michelle. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to propose this. And it sort of does build on a lot of what we were discussing tonight in terms of the rules. There is a memo in the packet. Um, I'll just briefly say that I respect um, each of you and your time. Um, and I know that taking extra time to have a retreat can often be challenging. I also wanted to say that this proposal is born of what I need as a counselor to bring my best self forward, and I think it would also greatly benefit um, the entire council. As I said in my memo, the council form of government is in its infancy here in Amherst, and many of us have had little or no experience serving on a public body. We have limitations to ensure we comply with the open meeting law, with ethics, and other limitations. So the question I've been asking myself is how do we make progress as individual counselors and as a governmental body to conduct the public's business in an effective, orderly, and efficient manner? And so I have taken some time recently to speak with folks who have significant experience working at higher levels of government. And the major takeaway that I've received from those conversations is the importance of establishing strong rules of procedure to debate issues and advance initiatives effectively and respectfully across differences. I may only speak for myself here, but um, I have felt that 
we have uh, a sort of family here in a way, which is wonderful in some respects. And in other respects, it can feel really personal when I don't think it has to. Um, I think what we do now as a council to cultivate and establish best practices and habits will provide a foundation for future councils and ideally will provide a model for our community. If the council agrees to pursue this suggestion, I would love to work with other counselors to do the necessary pre-work that makes retreats successful. Um, thank you for considering it and uh, I would be open to any questions if Lynn will allow time for that. Absolutely. Are there questions, comments? Pam. I think it's a great idea. I think we're working face to face and and brainstorming is always a really good way of of getting to the heart of um, items of of shared interest. So I think it's a great idea. Okay. Anika. Yes, yeah, so um, thank you, Michelle, for bringing that forward. Um, there's a lot that I do um, appreciate about what you just suggested. Uh, but I also do have some concerns or questions. Um, one in terms of like who would facilitate. And I know you led with saying what you would need personally and what you need personally. And in listening to comments this evening, our last couple of meetings, um, information, newsletters that have been sent out where, you know, I, I think just the level of um, how things are taking personal here, I do have a bit of concern around that, even, even with saying now, um, like we're family, I think that it's great that we can all get a, a, along, but we are here, we were voted in by our constituents to take care of the broader interest of the town and to govern the town effectively. And I do think there is a call for balance because sometimes I feel that we're there's an imbalance of what's personal. We have some counselors that have just recently um, proclaimed themselves to be um, the, the independents. Um, you know, when you've had no discussion and do not know other counselors personally. So when you make these um, claims publicly, you are, you know, um, it is it is borderline attack, though I don't want to make it personal because I'm not, I don't take it as such. Um, but it's also spreading misinformation and it's manipulative to the public that um, depends on our truth. You know, we've heard today someone speak about the black community wants something. I mean, there's three counselors of color. If you're not one of them, you do not speak for the community of color. And even those of us who are, um, you know, that's just within our purview and, and who relates to us. So, I mean, so I, I would hope that we'd have just um, not only with this, but we can maybe have um, some issues that are, are broader that just might help us to balance that we do have some very important issues that yes, we have to spend time on, but just to maybe take what is personal out of it in terms of, of voting. I mean, I think that it would be great. I personally think a um, you know, change of leadership is great, but I'm not voting. Um, I'm voting looking at balance. I'm voting looking at integrity, from my opinion, of, of who's going to bring that and looking at individual issues. Um, so I hope that we can also just look across the board, because my concerns personally are that we are looked at maybe by the town as just an ineffective body of leadership, you know, and I hope that we can, you know, stretch out and balance and just ensure that we are bringing all of the constituents views to the table who voted us in. Thank you. Shalini. I think it's an excellent idea to do this retreat. Um, I was wondering if there's a way to bring back the, the facilitator we had in the first retreat, just because we started this work actually of how as a body, we're going to go through the process of making decisions together, which incorporated our values, which incorporated public opinion. And I did go back or, you know, later on after the retreat, like, how are we going to incorporate what we learned I thought it was very powerful what we learned in the first retreat and how we're going to incorporate that into the processes that uh, we use to make decisions the processes we use to prioritize the goals 
And maybe it will be a good idea to bring back the same person and, and focus on the rules of procedure that Michelle is saying and, and the values and kind of maybe go back to um, seeing what we have done well and what we can improve. Um, uh, okay, that's all for now. Dorothy? Well, when we talk about going over rules or procedure, um, <clears throat> I want to say that I understand the necessity for rules, but um, I like many other people, but not all, don't really like it when they're used in certain ways. And I see myself as being a member of the council, but really I have one foot at least you know, I don't know about the two, in the general public. So when things get too technical, when the rules get too arcane, when I feel that games are being played, I usually ask to get things clarified because I think of the people watching. I think of their audience. Do they know what we're doing? Do they understand what's going on? Or are they saying, oh, they're just doing hocus pocus. They're just playing these games again because that turns them off. And our, our audience, our constituents, those are our future counselors. If the, 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 if we get too precious, okay, people don't want to be part of the group. They don't want to be part of the body. They're going to say, oh, I'm going to go there. And every time I talk, it's going to be, I didn't do it the right way, or I didn't remember this rule, or they're going to use a rule against me. You know, there's some people that find that fun, but a lot of people that might be very good on the council don't find that fun. And so I understand our need for rules, but I will say, I felt about that last meeting when we had a re-vote because it was new information. And then I said, what's the new information? And I didn't get any new information, but there was new information and we weren't told it. So I felt, I really felt played. I felt very played. So, you know, if we're going to have rules, let them be very simple, let them be very clear and let them be understood by everybody. That's it. Mandy Joe. <clears throat> So I don't oppose the idea of a retreat. I think retreats can be very valuable, but I think with one year remaining in the council, I would prefer a retreat that deals with what we want to get accomplished in the last year and talks about prioritizing something. We had some long conversations that weren't quite on the agenda about different zoning proposals that have been made and different proposals people might want and different proposals, different counselors as legislators that we were elected to do have been making and how they've been taking time on the council that maybe not all counselors have agreed with that committee time being taken up. And so I would like to see a retreat that at least talks about where we want to spend our committee time and maybe gets to some agreement about what our committees might be working on or where we would want them to focus um, in the last year. I also expressed some confusion as to Councillor Miller's proposal because it talks about the public participation and the civility portion of our rules only. And I am confused as to how um, that relates to the desire for people to know how to make motions and respond to motions and operate more efficiently on the council because I don't quite understand the connection between the public participation rule that was specifically mentioned in the memo and how we can more efficiently as counselors make it through debate. And so I don't quite get um, my own understanding as to the goal when it specifically mentions two rules that don't necessarily specifically relate to the efficiency of our process and meetings and getting through our business. Um, Alicia. Um, thank you, Mandy Joe. I don't I don't actually necessarily disagree with what Mandy Joe just said. I think that there is value in that as well, but I wanted to speak to Michelle's initiative, which I also very strongly support and agree with. Um, and I'm hoping that we can do that at some point, that we can find time to have that retreat and that we might be able to look into having a BIPOC facilitator. Shalini. I agree with what 
Mandijo just proposed, I think that's important. And I also want to actually, I think it would be nice to at some point standardize when a council is formed with sort of um, trainings, we can have maybe in year one when we just join what sort of training we need. And I think one thing that we could have the best rules, but if you don't trust, if you don't have that trust in the goodness, we can disagree, but just trust in the goodness in each other and trust our integrity. Um, we, we, will, we can always find flaws. Like I made a mistake here and you could read endless number of reasons why that was made you know and that's not a mistake so all i'm saying is that um i think trust building is an important issue i think having um which we didn't have this time but we did last time anti-racism training is important i think uh having a retreat to create a process that the town council uses to prioritize and how to get our work done all of these are important things and how do we find time? So I think we, yeah, I don't know. What do other people feel who haven't yet spoken? You know, because we have two things. One is just the internal processes as a council. How do we make decisions and um, so forth? And the other is how do we actually talk about the work we need to get done? Okay, thank you, Anna. So I think um, I appreciate Councillor Miller or Michelle for bringing this forward, um, and I'm using my own error in that last second as a good example of how we constantly are messing up our roles. Right? Um, one of the rules says we use first names, um, and we we miss that a lot. I think what I'm having a hard time with is that I. There are things that we are responsible for doing as counselors, reading and familiarizing ourselves with the rules of procedure, with the charter, with um, you know parliamentary procedure. Those are things that um, I agree with what Shalini was saying. That should be offered as, as training when we first start this role. I see that as part of our responsibility. Um, that's not to say it shouldn't necessarily be a topic of retreat. I'm bringing this up because each of these four items could themselves be half day retreats. And so I think that these are big, these are big topics. Um, I want to highlight a couple things, and I believe these may have already been mentioned. Uh, this should not be internally facilitated. This should be facilitated by an outside person. Um, and I'd really love to see GOL develop this proposal a little bit more as, especially as y'all go through the process of um, looking at the rules of procedure for this year, because I think that some of this either like it, it it weaves in and out of what GOL does as we kind of bring forward what rules we'd like to see changed or what rules we'd like to add or take away or whatever. Um, you know, and I, I think that to Dorothy's point, our our rules are a living document, you know, like the charter is stuck for a little while, but the rules are living. And so if there are rules that we can't seem to follow, um, we shouldn't have them in our rules or we should be following them. Right. And so I think that if they're so rigid, um, that it feels impossible for people to engage. Great. This is our opportunity to change them. So I think I'd, I'd love to see GOL dig into this a little bit and, and streamline the, the outcomes of a retreat, because I, I don't want to set us up for, um, just feeling like we had a retreat and nothing came out of it because we tried to bite off more than we could chew in a half day. But I, I mean, I love retreats. It's like my job. So I'm, I'm a big fan. <laughs> Okay, are there any other comments? So I, my follow-up to this would be to send something out, uh, ask for, um, basically I'm hearing two ideas. One is focus on priorities. One is focus on how we conduct business um, and get some sense, also some sense of other councils who might like to work on that. Although Anna has suggested GOL. Um, and also some sense of dates when people would be available so that we're working toward a date that's nearer in the future rather than down the road. Michelle, thank you for putting uh, your proposal together. Uh, it's comprehensive. <laughs> it's a lot, but yeah. thank you for uh, bringing it forward. Thank Are you. there any other comments from counselors at this time? Mandy Joe. 
We're into just the counselor comment section, right? Yes, we are. I want to say thank you to Jennifer Moiston. I know she's probably not listening right now, um, but I'm hoping it can be relayed to her. Um, particularly with her work with the Spring Festival Chinese New Year celebration, um, we didn't know, and she particularly didn't know how many people to expect. And there were at least 200 people there. Yeah. And uh, she handled the last minute um, need to get more stuff and find more stuff <laughs> and make food last tremendously well. Um, I know she was very frazzled that day. You could see it from anyone, but I just want to thank her for all the work that went into planning it and then all of the spontaneous work she needed to do to make it um, be wonderful with how many people actually showed up. I totally agree. There were about six or seven counselors there that day at different times, and it was just a magnificent event. And agree. Any other comments? Uh, seeing none, then we are adjourned.